And the objectives for our meeting tonight, and, and I could just reiterate a little bit what what uh, Ron said, that this is our first meeting really jumping into, into uh, I guess, the content of what, what are some of the specifics of what might be uh, appearing in a in the general sustainability plan. And, and, and our previous meeting was focused on sharing a lot of information. And this one is really going to a deep dive around three sustainability indicators in particular, groundwater levels, groundwater storage, and seawater intrusion. And, and we've really tried to carve out most of the time for this meeting for you guys to answer some key questions. One is a question about their applicability of those three uh, sustainability indicators into uh, the, the, the Mid-County Basin uh, GSP. The second is a discussion where we'll start out in, uh, in breakout groups to, dis to, dis to discuss some, what are some of the significant and unreasonable conditions that might be associated with each of these three sustainability indicators. And then additionally, for each of these three sustainability indicators, uh, what are some of the, uh, what would some uh, undesirable results look like? So, so it's really a deep dive into these three. We'll be looking at the next three uh, sustainability indicators at our next meeting. We will share a little bit of information. There were a number of information requests at our last meeting, and so we want to provide updates with you on that, but we're really not anticipating going deep into that, and if we have questions, we can uh, at least note them here and follow up afterwards, but we really want to free up time for discussions around these three uh, initial sustainability indicators. So, um, so, so that's uh, our objectives for tonight. The, the way the um, agenda is gonna work, just so everybody gets a feel for the flow of the meeting, um, we'll, we'll uh, start with our confirmation of last month's meeting summary. But we will do a little bit, uh, we will cover essentially some of the uh, 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 review of some of the information that we are sharing with you and let you know some things that aren't done yet that are information. And then we'll pause and do a little bit of a, an orientation reminder. This will be information that Derek uh, had, uh, or, or Eugene or others from Hydrometrics had presented during our orientation sessions in the fall. Uh, but it's important information for to be top of mind as we enter into our discussions. And then we'll move into these three core objectives for the meeting. We'll talk about the applicability of the three sustainability ind indicators of focus. We'll talk about uh, significant and unreasonable conditions associated with them. And we'll actually break out into small groups of the advisory committee members for, to, to initiate that discussion. Uh, we'll take a break and then we'll come back and do one more uh, uh, breakout group discussion uh, on the topic of undesirable results. And, and the way the breakout group uh, discussions will work is that we have three, you know, three tables around the room here. We, we've pre-populated, did a little social engineering. We've suggested some uh, groupings that include the advisory committee members as well as the executive team there. You'll have uh, help from our team to capture flip chart notes so you guys can think and we'll capture notes along the way. Um, the, uh, after a, a period of time of discussion, the, the groups will then come back into plenary and you'll report back on what your, or your, your particular group discussed to the full group, and then we'll pause and have a discussion about what are some of the common themes, what are some of the similarities or differences that we heard from the different breakout groups. And, and we'll do those uh, breakout groups for the significant and unreasonable conditions topic and for the undesirable results. And with regard to the public, we're inviting the public to, to be able to, you can move around or you can sit and watch one or the other, we, we invite you guys to to, uh, to, to sit as observers at that point. Um, uh, after we finish that second uh, breakout group discussion on undesirable results, we will pause for public comment. And here we're, we're really inviting the public at this point to weigh in in particular. You, you can speak to other topics if you'd like, but we'd love to hear your input on the topics of significant and unreasonable conditions and, unres and undesirable results for our three focal sustainability indicators. Um, and then we'll, we'll finish uh, with a recap and next steps. So we're going to 9 o'clock. It's, it's a, a longer evening when we're trying to plan this agenda. It was like, wow, how are we going to create enough space for the advisory committee members to go into enough detail around three sustainability indicators. Um, but uh, we, we think we'll make it and we'll, we'll be sensitive to people's time. So that, that's where we are with the um, agenda. Uh, any questions about why we're here tonight, what we're trying to achieve before we move on? Okay, great. Okay, 
Um, the last thing uh, we'll talk about before we jump into uh, our first agenda item is, is this document. And so I think uh, this was sent out in the packet, so everyone should have this. We do have some hard copies back there. Uh, this is our sort of our big picture if you're like, where are we in the process? This is the document that we're using right now. Um, it has undergone a few refinements, and I'd love to do it. Would help for like uh, putting you on the spot to ask you how this changed a little bit, or I can speak to that as well. You, you come in. Uh, I'll go ahead and speak to it. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so she gave me these. I didn't know whether she wanted to share. But uh, a, a couple of key changes is that one, that there's a recognition that we really need to discuss projects and management actions earlier in the process than we had projected in the first version of that. So this this version reflects that change. And the other key change is that, um, is that, that with regard to discussions around measurable objectives, that, that there was a recognition that they're developed with the support of modeling projects and management actions, and not before that. And so that discussion of measurable objectives is actually moved back a little bit uh, until after, especially we get into the modeling. Those are the two changes that are now reflected in this. And again, we'll return to this at the end of the day today. And, and as we discuss in, the, in our chartering meetings, that, that if uh, advisory committee members feel that you know, we're, we're missing things along the way with this, like, let's have a discussion around this. Please let us know. So, so that's where we are in, in terms of our process. And, and then, so uh, let's move to the first agenda item, which is uh, us to consider and, and uh, confirm or, or hear any comments on the draft uh, meeting summary from the January 24th meeting. And, and here, we'd just like to, uh, hopefully you guys got to take a look at that in the packet. And we want to open it up now to any questions or comments about that draft. We'll take them here, and, and as we've done before, we, we then uh, will incorporate what we hear, and then it gets moved on to the, the uh, MGA board for consideration. Please come and say I appreciated the level of reporting in this version this time, and also just wanted to note that I was actually present when he wasn't going to show up. Wow. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> That's an outstanding comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, other, any other comments or questions about the draft summary? Okay, good. So, okay, we'll make that change. Thank you for, for, for uh, your read on that. And, okay, so I think we're going to move forward to um, essentially it's a, a suite of updates on information requests that have been coming out of the, the advisory committee. And there are three documents that were part of your packet that uh, I think I'm gonna ask either Rosemary or Darcy to speak to. And then there are a couple of documents that you asked for that we haven't completed yet, and we'll describe what those are and tell you where they are in, in, a, in the production process and then we hope to get them to you. So, okay. Rosemary, I can go to you. Right, so I have, uh, there, there's a document, a front and side, front and side, back side document going around in the handout. If you don't already have this, it's these two pieces of paper. So we were asked for a couple of things in the um, at the last meeting. One was to sort of describe the relationships of the various um, items. These are some extra that go to back to the back in the back. To describe the relationship of the various pieces of the groundwater sustainability plan, and that's described on this um, this this document here, this one pager. So there's basically, uh, the, the output is the final plan. The final product is the, the plan with all of the elements uh, for the sustainability objectives or the sustainable management criteria projects to achieve those criteria and plan implementation. So that's the ultimate goal. There are several other sections of the plan that are inputs to the major sort of uh, moving part, which is the sustainable management criteria. And the, those are the things that are in section two of the plan. And again, I want to uh, refer you back to the annotated um, plan content, the outline of the plan that we handed out last time and that's part of the packet from uh, the materials that we provided at the last meeting. So you can see the detail, but I picked out the things that are particularly relevant as inputs to 
setting the sustainable management criteria, uh, and also the projects. And you'll see that at least for the um, the section two things are really things like uh, land use, the water budget, other things that are really inputs to setting these criteria. How do we reach these criteria, and do we know whether or not we've overdone or underdone the amount of uh, the projects or the how much water we're going to produce to bring the system to sustainability is really in the project section. And there's a feedback loop here that you can sort of see articulated as something that occurs when you say, okay, well, we think this is a solution and you put it into the model and to the thinking about how you would reach the sustainable management criteria, the measurable objectives, avoid the undesirable results, and you say, does that work or doesn't it work or is it the least cost approach? So there's a, a tended to be a kind of an iterative process looking at um, the projects and it's one of the reasons why we talked about changing the schedule that you saw a minute ago because we think we need to introduce where we are just discussing possible solutions to the overdraft of the basin. Um, so this is really the relationships of the big chunks of the plan. And uh, the second thing that you asked for is on this sheet of paper, which was kind of a crosswalk between uh, the elements of the, the individual sections of the plan and you can see that I've given specific elements of section 2.2 of the plan and uh, 2. Point, I mean 2.1 and 2.2, and also the projects and the um, from section four, and crosswalk those to the sex that how they apply or whether they relate to the sustainable management criteria, both to the overall goal and to the individual criteria. This wasn't, you know, this isn't done at a level of total detail, but it does dive down. Some of the things that you'll see in the, the description of the various lines under 2.1 and 2.2 describe in a little bit more detail something that, for example, under summary of ju jurisdictional areas 2.1.1 uh, and other features. So um, this one is particularly relevant to a couple of the overall sustainability goal and to stream flow issues and also to land subsidence. Uh, this was had to do with existing land use designations and density of wells. Now out of the things that are in 2.1.1, uh, you, you will see that if you go look back at that uh, document, the annotated outline of the um, of the, the plan itself, you will see that there are a number of uh, items in addition to the ones I pointed out here. So I picked out the ones that were particularly relevant and the ones that didn't seem relevant, just inf good information overall were put under here. So <laughs> that's what's on this table. Um, a crack at showing the crosswalk relationships between the individual sections of the plan and the sustainable management criteria and the goal setting. So that's my piece. Okay, thank you. So yeah, any questions? Well, we about this question. Sure. Uh, just as part of this whole <coughs> simplified question, on your sustainability goals here, what what's the distinction between groundwater levels and groundwater storage? I think we should let Derek answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Pardon. They are related. <coughs> yeah. Groundwater storage, though, is going to be a single number for the basin. You're going to say, we want this much water in storage at a certain time. Groundwater levels are measured at individual places. So they're very closely related. They're going to have an impact on each other. Um, and probably the groundwater levels, if you meet those, you're probably going to meet your groundwater storage uh, criteria OK. You do have to set these two criteria, though, in a different way. So when you say a number related to storage, we're talking a certain number of gallons? A large feet. number of gallons. Yeah. So acre feet would acre be an easier feet. number yeah. to work with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Thanks, Jack. So I have clarifying questions. Please, please. So Rosemary, yeah. I was a bit confused by your feedback loops on the relationships of the other sustainability problems. Right. You don't need to imply that the project is going to define the sustainable sustainable management criteria. I think that the, the question is what project will help you achieve the sustainable management um, criteria and, and the overall goal. And 
there can be projects that uh, produce, you know, the right amount of water at X cost, and there can be a project that produce the right amount of water at Y cost. And you might say, oh, well, we have two ways of getting there, which is actually the most cost effective. Find that sweet spot, and that's really what the feedback loop is about. Or, gosh, we have a project here that we think is really good, we really like this project, uh, but it doesn't produce enough water to solve the problem. So now we put that into the sort of our thinking about it and we find out, oh gosh, we need more water. Or it produces more water than we think is necessary to solve the problem. So then the question is, do you want to change the project, uh, the nature of the project, so it's smaller or it's phased in in a different way? Okay. That's really what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about a feedback loop there. Okay, great. So uh, another of the documents that was shared in the packet was an annotated version of the, the GSP and Darcy, if you can share that. So um, there was a request to have the annotated outline that the EWR had prepared sort of fleshed out with some of the material that we already have at the NGA because of the years of groundwater planning that's already happened. And that's really what um, this draft NGA Section two outline is about. It's probably it's all it's printed in there copies on the side and there are also copies in the packet. It's probably the most useful in the packet because there are links to everything that we have. Um, so all of the links in the actual you know PDF that's in the packet you can click on and it'll take you places and hopefully the the references are useful enough to get you to the information that we have. We also included in both language and text boxes, some of the summary information that we have that's already available. I know that a few of you have already looked at it and used it because I've had questions about some of the, the resources and um, what's going on. So hopefully this is the beginning of a conversation about the information that we have that's easier for you to access. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. And I view this as sort of the beginning of the conversation, pretty much what the memo says on the front. And so if you, if you recall, there was a request to start putting that information together and a recognition that there will be a, a living document, that, that it'll be added to over time. But we certainly want it to be a, an important reference for the advisory committee that you could start using sooner rather than later. So I think that we'll continue to update and refine that document. Yeah, and, and if you have questions about it, feel free to email those to me because hopefully that's one of the ways that I'll be able to, you know, continue to revise this and expand it as we get more information going through the process. And the reason that we started with Section 2 is because it is the place where we have the most information available that helps you start making decisions and informing your knowledge on the basis. Okay. So, Darcy, could you just summarize briefly what are the main source documents for the things that are linked in here? So the main source documents that are linked in here are in the um, NGA reference library and the primary ones are really the 20 or so years of um, groundwater management plans that have been produced inside the basin. Um, so in 2007, Soquel Creek and Central Water District prepared a groundwater management plan that covers the requirements of a different statute that basically um, requires a plan but doesn't require you to, to meet sustainability criteria in the way that Sigma does. So that's really the, the framework that a lot of the Sigma regulations kind of jump off of for the plan. And those are updated, they've been updated annually. Um, so there's a whole lot of references that say 2007 and then what the updates were in each one of the, the years. And then last year, for the water year 2015-2016, we did a biennial uh, review and report, which is the most current physical reference document. And that's where a lot of the summary information came from. There's also other documents, but those are really the primary sources. Okay. So there are a couple of documents that are or information pieces that were requested that, that we didn't finish yet, but that are in progress and wanted to just name them right now. And I know is it is it you, Rosemary or Darcy who will share these or I can do it too. 
Okay, so so one was, is, I guess essentially it's building out the list of what are the, the potential projects or actions that could be done. And, and there was a, a bunch of work done over a year ago on that topic, and we're in the process of expanding a table of potential water supply augmentation options. And so that's something that is not done yet, but that we, we do plan to uh, to refine and bring to, to the um, advisory committee here. And the second, I think, was, uh, was a request from you, John um, Kennedy, to, to present an example, you know, sort of a numeric example, of uh, setting a sustainable management criteria, just so we could get a feel for like, what does it look like? And, and so that, uh, we, we actually wanted to do that today, but it was tough fitting it in, so that's something we will bring in in a subsequent meeting, but it's, uh, we've, we've done a lot of thinking on that one already. And I think the, the last uh, document that is being really refined is at our last meeting, we uh, talked about some draft policy questions that had been generated from staff. We talked about it in the room, and then we gave uh, advisory committee members some time to provide additional input on those, and we have received several comments, and so our, our intent, and actually some of them came in rather recently, so our intent is to continue to up that document, update that document, and bring it back to the uh, advisory committee as we go. And that document is also intended to be a living document of reference that we consider along the way and that we, we, we go back to as we consider what you know what, what is the, the value that this advisory committee is really bringing toward the different discussion topics as we kind of flesh out the components of the of the GSP itself. So so anything else in terms of information, we, we didn't want to go into lots of detail here, but let you know that we're giving you stuff and we're Creating more information to David. Uh, so, is the annotator outline in the in the uh, library section in addition to being in the packet? It isn't. It's in the packet. I can send it to you separately if you'd like to have it. Separately. Well, I just show you that the annotated outline is going to be a working document, and it's going to get updated per periodically. So, right. so while different versions of it might be in the packet, it would seem like it should be accessible somewhere in the documents library, so you can always get the most current version easily. I, you know, and I think Tim and I have discussed that and we haven't figured out the best way to do it. I know the one that is currently in the packet when we post the meeting summary um, from here with the recording, we're planning on having that separate so it's in the, the meeting materials live so you don't have to go through the packet for it. Um, but I'll, I'm thinking about a way to put it in the resource library that makes it clear that it's not set in stone. There's quite a bit of information. Um, yes. So, what would be helpful for me is for the mantra of the executive committee to be to focus this advisory committee on what the important issues are for them to address. And the antithesis is we've got this other stuff covered. So just so that I can put my time in the best place. And I'm sure there, you know, I, there might be some you know, feedback from the advisory committee as well on you know, that they want to address things other than what the executive committee suggests. But as, as much as possible, please focus us into the right, or the right places to put our time. Yeah, and, and when you're figuring out how you're going to you know, tell people this is a working document, um, because it is a working document, it would be helpful when you as you update and annotate, if you can somehow mark when the updates have been made from, from what meeting it came from, so that we can easily track our changes over time and the decisions we've made <coughs> and how they reflect in the document. Thanks. So I'm going to use Bruce's comment as a, a good segue to moving forward. So we're, in terms of where the where the advisory committee can really provide its its most uh, influential input right now is really starting to look at these first the sustainability indicators and 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 then providing input on whether that they're applicable or not and tell us more about the the uh, the, the, the unusual conditions and the um, Whatever the other one is. Exactly. Thank you. And and so, but before we jump into the the details on that, uh, we want to pause and actually go back, do a quick refresher of what are these things so that I'm forgetting. <laughs> and then we'll go into the details. So I think I'm going to pass this baton over to you, Derek. Yeah, I'll start with it. Thanks. Great. 
Thank you very much, Eric. As Eric pointed out, we're just going to go over a review right now of some things that we uh, mentioned in some of the early uh, meetings here. Let's see. I'll try one of these. And review some concepts that you're going to want to be thinking about uh, during the rest of this meeting today. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is just some of the terminology. The terminology in Sigma is defined rather specifically, and we want to be using the terminology in a certain way. This is a hydrograph that I presented at an earlier meeting. And the point here is there are a few ideas of the sustainable management criteria that you're going to want to keep in your mind. If this is a hydrograph, the blue line is groundwater level over time. And that first vertical black bar in the middle represents today. So there's historical water levels and then future water levels on the right hand side. There's a red line you'll see across uh, the second half that's labeled minimum thresholds. That's the first of the sustainable management criteria you want to remember. That's the floor. That's the floor that you don't want your water levels to drop below. And that's what's going to be important about that particularly today is that minimum threshold and that's set at every monitoring well. That is supposed to be the numerical, the quantitative value of what you consider sustainable and unreasonable. So when we go over that today, what is sustainable and unreasonable, that's what you're thinking about. It's that floor you don't want to go below. There. Sorry, sorry. Significant. Significant. <laughs> sustainable is the other one. Significant and unreasonable. That's what you want. Thank you. <laughs> Significant and unreasonable. Uh, the green line is the measurable objective. We aren't going to go over those today, but that is the goal that you're shooting for. So there's a floor and a goal right there that you're shooting for. So those are a couple of the concepts. These are concepts that are set at every monitoring point, okay, every well. Unlike the undesirable result, the undesirable result is set for the entire basin. It is a statement that is set for the entire basin. We're going to be talking about undesirable results today. The undesirable result, this is the definition of it here, and it's a little obtuse here. It's the combination of those minimum thresholds, remember that I just talked about, and it's a combination of how many can be exceeded that would be significant and unreasonable there. The best way to think about this is with an example, and this is the example. An undesirable result might occur when 10% of your groundwater elevations drop below their minimum thresholds. A couple things you should know about undesirable results. Like I said, they're set across the entire basin for one, con one for each of the six sustainability indicators. Um, they, are, they are the statement that defines sustainability. These are the statements that you're going to have to prove in the future. Basically, you're gonna, this 10% number, you're going to have to prove that every five years to say, yes, we're heading towards sustainability. That's the very definition of sustainability. The other thing you should realize is this is how you incorporate flexibility into your plan. If you make that 10% number a very small, 1%, what you're really saying is we aren't going to be flexible. The minimum thresholds that we have set, we want to meet everywhere. If you make that a large number, you're saying, these are our minimum thresholds, but we're going to allow some exceedances. We're going to be more flexible. And later on today, we're going to be asking you exactly that question. How flexible are you going to want to be in this undesirable result? That's going to be a key, key question. So just to concretize that a little further, yes. Joe, if we have 10 monitoring points yes. for groundwater levels, then what we're saying here is, OK, one of those can be below the threshold at a time. At a time. And if two of them are, then we, do we have an undesirable result? Right. <coughs> if two of them, then two of them below the threshold would be an undesirable result. There. Okay. And we're going to talk a lot about things you ought to think about when you are questioning how flexible do you want to be. Yes. Um, so uh, this subject has an example, but since there are six sustainability indicators, yes. then I assume this gets complicated to be 10% of these versus 8% of those, or because here we're not saying which one of the six, right? So following the example, if there's 10 monitoring wells and there's 60 uh, minimum thresholds, 10 times six, uh, but assuming each of those applies to each of them. 
Um, and then we're still not saying 10%, we'd say 10% of salt water versus 5% of you know, groundwater, ground, ground uh, subsidence and so on. I think I'll answer your question correctly here. You're going to come up with a unique statement for each of the six oh, groundwater six statements. There, you're going to have six statements, Thank you, one for each indicator. No, one for there. Six and Thank you me. can change that percentage. And that's going to be important in your discussion later. Because in your discussion later, you might say, we want to be fairly flexible for this indicator and very strict on this other indicator. And that's just fine. OK? Good. Yes. Are we also going to be saying, for example, that undesirable results could be exceeding going below minimum thresholds for more than three of the indicators or something like that? Undesirable results are for each indicator. They're separate for each indicator. So you say you have one undesirable result for the groundwater level indicator, and it sets, sets, stands alone. You have another undesirable result for seawater intrusion, it stands alone there. You don't, you cannot you cannot have any undesirable results to be sustainable, okay? You can't say it's okay to be undesirable in two of them. All of them have to be not undesirable. There's a lot of negatives here. I can't say they're all undesirable. But you cannot have an undesirable result on any of the six indicators, okay? Yes, John. Can you simplify the whole process by focusing, say, on one or two indicators? For example, you say, okay, we're going to, we maintain our groundwater levels to prevent seawater intrusion and prevent loss of stream flow. That's automatically going to take care of storage and groundwater levels and subsidence, and we don't even have to think about those. Yes, you can. And there, you can take that short <coughs> Uh, and in practical sense, that's what's going to happen okay. at the end of this process. And in practical sense, the groundwater elevations will drive most of the other indicators there, okay? There are some shortcuts you can take, but you have to start down this path wow. and then say, we have set these minimum thresholds, <laughs> and by the way, we're going to use this one minimum threshold for all six indicators or something like that, okay? So there are some, we have to start down this path, but there are some shortcuts you'll end up okay. with. Okay, so I want to go over quickly the steps for defining the sustainability. Um, and in these, this is just a reminder the dark sentences are what we're going to be dealing with today, and the lighter things we'll be dealing with some other time. So we're starting by start by saying of these six sustainability indicators, which ones apply to this basin, and then we're going to start talking about that question of what is significant and unreasonable. And that, remember, when we talk about it today, we're going to be talking about at individual well points, what, in, what you consider in your gut a significant and unreasonable problem. We will go back then and quantify those significant and unreasonable issues with, by setting minimum thresholds. That's the quantification. We're not going to get into that today, right? We're going to talk some about how we want to combine the minimum thresholds into undesirable results. Like I said, we're going to talk about what, uh, how flexible we want to be. And so that's the next step. And then you go back and you say, OK, if we've combined them all, and you look on the map and say, we've combined them all, and we've allowed 20% of the water levels to drop below minimum thresholds, then you have to, get again, look at your gut and say, is that really what we want our basin to look like or not? And if it's not, you have to iterate back through and start saying, maybe we set the minimum thresholds wrong, maybe we set um, the undesirable results wrong. Other items that we'll be getting into later, uh, and uh, this was brought up a little earlier, uh, as with Rosemary talking about how the actions interplay with the sustainable management criteria, we'll start looking at your management actions and your projects. Do they actually meet? achieve your objectives? Do they avoid the undesirable results? If not, you'll probably want to go back and iterate again and say, maybe we, our projects are too big or too small, or maybe we have to redefine our undesirable results. So that's how everything works together. Yes, Kate? With the minimum thresholds, this is a, perhaps sounds bizarre, but I know that there are certain uh, ecosystems that depend on groundwater yes. where uh, exceeding a certain amount of storage poses risks because of flooding, for instance, mm -hmm. to vegetation. Is that built into the minimum threshold by a statement of seeking 
a range within a certain uh, factor? You have stumped the stars, Kate. <laughs> uh, no, it is not, actually. It is not officially built into it. It is something we're going to have to consider, though. Um, if there is a possibility of flooding uh, groundwater-dependent ecosystems or something, we'll have to think about that. It is not, it's going to be difficult, I would say, to get that concept into the minimum thresholds approach. But let me think about that, OK? That's a good point. If you want more information on the sustainable management criteria, there is a draft document out there on the, of a best management practice. It gives you much more information about what these criteria are and how to set them. With that, I am going to turn this over to Georgina. She's going to talk some about the groundwater conditions that you're going to want to keep in the back of your mind as you're talking about the management criteria. Okay. Yep, like Derek says, I'm going to do a really brief uh, review of just the groundwater condi conditions that pertain to the three sustainability indicators we're going to be talking about today. And um, you can get much more information on the MGA website. Um, on, there was a state of the basin orientation session, and then there's also all the annual reports that Darcy was talking about on the, on the website. So the first sustainability indicator is groundwater levels. And this and we use levels to assess the, the health of the basin. Um, what you see up here is a map with some hydrographs um, for different aquifers across the basin. And the hydrograph is showing you changes in groundwater levels over time. Um, what you see, in general, what we are seeing is that, yes, there has been ups and downs, and there were some long-term declines. But since about 2008, the groundwater levels have been um, rising steadily. And this is not due to abundant rainfall, it's, it's due to changing uh, basin operations, how, which wells are pumped and where they're being pumped. And uh, you, on, on the one over here, <laughs> the one on the aquifer, the TU aquifer, um, that you see a 30 foot decline and that's because new wells were, were put into that aquifer and have been pumping. So the, these are all things that we take into account when we start talking about what's significant and unreasonable in the basin. We're going to look back at the history and see what in the past what do we feel was a significant and unreasonable. And, and where we are today, is that a good enough place to be or not? Another way to look at groundwater levels is contour maps. Some people uh, like to look at contour maps. They're, they're snapshots in time. Um, of lines of equal groundwater elevation ac across the basin. Here we have, um, this is one of the aquifers BC. On the left hand side you see this, these concentric circles and they represent the pumping depression from a number of wells here. Groundwater levels, um, well the colors in red show that groundwater levels are actually below sea level. And so <coughs> management action, something you're going to hear a lot about, the ways we can operate the basin differently were put in in place to change that. So on the right, in the present day, so the first one was 2009, so the, the one on the right is present day, and we don't have that pumping depression anymore, and the groundwater levels are not below sea level. So these, so if you go through the annual reports, you'll see these contour maps done for all of the aquifers, um, for all of the years that the reports are, are published, and you can see how things have changed over time. Do you have a question? How are we going to determine which of our aquifers are the most critical to measure when we have BCD and AA and TU? I mean, we will have, we will be measuring all of them. There's not just one. Uh, we will have multiple wells monitoring. I know we'll be measuring them all, but if we're looking for key indicators in terms of what we choose to put in the plan, are you suggesting we have to put every single one of those aquifers in the plan? Yes. 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 You do. If they supply water. Yeah. yeah. They make up the basin. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Now, John, you might focus on certain aquifers over others as far as where you implement a project because it might be a more productive aquifer that you're going to be using in the future. But you have to be monitoring all of them. And they all have to reach sustainability. So we have to have thresholds and measurable objectives for if we have 10 monitoring locations in the basin and each one of those if, if there are multiples we have to have 10 times 3 or 10 times 4 or whatever 
more than that. Yeah. <laughs> With six, seven. The layers of the cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that we'd be putting you wealth in. You're not no, getting no, I'm you not, wealth. No, no, I know. I'm, well. I'm yeah. talking about having to set yes. objectives for yes. Yes. 60, right. even though we're choosing 10 locations. Right. Yes. All right. Groundwater storage. Now this is uh, the second sustainability indicator and it is a little bit more tricky. Derek's going to go over it a little bit more. In the past we've had no storage, change in storage estimates for the basin. Uh, now we're developing the, the uh, basin-wide <coughs> groundwater model and this is the first time many in this room are seeing yeah. anything to do with storage plotted up. And um, this is showing us change in storage from 1985 to 2015, I think it is, yes. And the bigger the bar, the greater the storage change. The different colors are, re are for the different aquifers. It's confusing. So let's just look at the black line. Yes? Is this telling us the actual water that is being stored or the capacity <coughs> no. of the aquifer to be no. stored? It is not, it is not mm -hmm. the total storage. It is the change in storage each year. And, but, it, it, but is that capacity for storage or actual storage? Change. Yeah, it's just talking about change. It's a change from that's one year to the next. How much we used up in that year. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, can you yeah. say what percentage that is? I mean, you can talk about a change and it may look big, but if you then say, well, but we're talking about something that's enormous yeah. as a percentage is tiny, this chart to me didn't <coughs> give me any kind of basis for measure, saying, well, that's a big deal or not a big deal. Okay, Derek's going to talk more about the storage, and it's not what a lot of us would think. It's the total storage is, is the sustainability indicator. It's the amount of reduced storage that happens each year. So it is the change of storage they want us to look at. The model. But why? Ask Derek. I don't think BWR knows either. I mean, if I, if I have a gas tank, you know, and it goes down one percent, I go big deal, right? If it goes down ten percent, I care a lot. This isn't telling me how big the gas tank. This graph might not, but it is just an indicator of the type of thing you're going to be thinking about, which is well, you, you may be thinking about when one line's not getting there. Which is, my okay, you know, and we're, we won't start with this graph. This is a graph to show that there are tools now to say how does groundwater storage change over time. When when we get a little farther along, we're going to go into this saying how much groundwater do we need in storage? What is it? <coughs> what do you use groundwater storage for? And from there, we will go forward and start talking about, well, how much, how do we get that much groundwater in storage? But that my take on this is increase your analogy is perfect for Central Valley because there's not an adverse effect if you still have water to take. Here, there could be an adverse effect because the groundwater levels, if the storage goes down, could be lower than what's necessary to keep the seawater out. So I'm not even sure storage is as much of a concern as as the adverse effect of seawater and sure. <coughs> And Bruce is right. This will come up later. This was part of my later talk. We are going to talk about groundwater storage. We are required <coughs> to come up with some metrics of how much we want to have in storage. My guess is it is going to be a secondary issue if you meet your other metrics, mm -hmm. avoiding seawater intrusion getting your groundwater levels where you want them to be, you will meet your storage requirements. This is something John brought up earlier. <coughs> let's wait Let's wait till we get there and we'll start talking about it. It's, the storage is a little tricky now to deal with here. And I see a lot of people pointing at these charts. So another confusing thing is that the positive, the numbers are actually a loss of storage. Right. And the, 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 positive, the negative numbers are a, a gain of storage. So what you see is that in, in mid-80s, we had big changes of storage. We were losing storage. But as time goes on, that amount of storage that we're losing each year is decreasing till about uh, mid-90s. And then we actually hits about zero. And then since then, it's, 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 there's been much less change of swings in storage each year. And there have been some gains, some years of gains, and, and a few more of, of, of losses. So. That's what that shows. I apologize for sticking on this and coming back. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding 
why storage would change when we're talking about underground holding capacity. I just, I'm just a basic concept, I'm not grasping. So it's the amount of groundwater in storage. That can change. The bowl stays the same size, yeah. but the water level. That's me too, John. <laughs> it's, it's not, not the capacity. It's just what's down yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's what's, it's what's, what's it's down it's there based on yeah. monitoring wells and depth. Yeah. Right. So, so maybe you say something yeah. about what affects what's down there besides pumping, yeah. which is it's not the like amount of rainfall. So there are right. several factors that are affecting what's in storage, right? Right. There's a. So there's. So whatever comes into the bowl, rainfall generally, and what and from neighboring basins, so you get some groundwater inflow, and then there's losses, which are mostly from pr uh, production. There's evapotranspiration, there's loss to the sea. There's also gain from the sea if there's seawater intrusion. So there's all this these positives and negatives playing out, and that would change storage each year. So. In general, you know, we, we, you saw the, the hydrographs going down um, at the beginning of this period. Well, the storage mimics that. This change in storage is mimic, mimic, mimicking I think the that. confusion is, is it storage or groundwater that's being stored? Mm -hmm. Right. It, which is, I mean, that's what they're this asking. Is, this is change in groundwater storage. It's the groundwater in, in storage. storage. So think of it as groundwater in storage. Mm -hmm. <coughs> not the size of the bowl, the bowl, but what's in the bowl. That's yeah. Really Okay. Yes. Uh, no, that. Thanks for pointing that out. We think of it. We think of groundwater storage as the amount of groundwater, but it's yeah. That is kind of. This is my final question. I'll, I'll be quiet over here in the corner pocket. Is there any reason that we could not get back to that groundwater storage level of 1985? That's the lowest. That's, that's not what we want. Yeah. That's, that's the worst. We want actually 2006. Oh. That's, 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 that's <laughs> okay. That's the reason. It's we a very confusing chart. <laughs> I'm sorry, and now I put it in, but. <laughs> 2006 is the maximum in storage. No, no, no. 2006. Yeah. Yeah. It, was it was a gain. It was a year we had the most gain. Right. Well, good gain. It's a delta yeah. charge. Yeah. It's not the only right. showing the change. Right. It's not only showing the change. How much water is right. right. it's it's the relative change. The change. How much you lost the gain each year. year. Right. Yeah. So I don't get that. Yeah. The obvious question from all this is why don't we have a graph that shows us how much water we have in storage yeah. versus That's how much is possible. Because the, the very confusing way the legislation was written. Well, and I, I don't mean about those guys. I mean for ourselves. <laughs> for, yourselves, for yourselves would be helpful. Yeah. Where you're going to end up, though, is how much water you have in storage isn't what you have to measure. It's how much you can pump. Right. To keep water in storage. Right. It's a yeah. very confusing thing, but we could get you. Yeah. Well, there, I'm not sure we want to show you a graphic of how much is in storage, and I will get to that in about 15 minutes as to why that's a misleading graphic. Okay? Be because my understanding is in the past, that was always a sort of a questionable concept about whether we even could peg what was there. People would take shots at it, but it was always sort of theoretical. Yes, it is, and it's a, and it's a very misleading number there. Right. So I want to, I will point that out why in a few minutes, okay. why that's a misleading number to okay. say we have this much water in storage. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want yeah. to say that we, there's a part two to the storage discussion that's coming up and I was going to say folks can hold on to some of their yeah. questions until we get there. I just I think we'll help clarify. To clarify that I'm reading this graph correctly. So when it's positive, it means it's that it, it's, it's losing water and when it's negative it's gaining water and so at the end we have negative positive negative positive negative positive alternating it's like you're filling up the bowl a little bit you're, yeah. you're taking out filling up yeah. so it's so yeah, this was yeah. also plotted cumulatively and I thought that was going to confuse all of you even more and it confused me and so that's why I didn't include but at that end part the line is pretty flat because you know, you're, you're having this about equal in and out. So is the real name for this chart the annual change in groundwater in storage? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The title. The title. But, 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 but upside down. But upside down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the upside down. So it's down to the beginning of your title and it's right. Okay, we got Note, noted that we need to work on the presentation of groundwater storage. <laughs>
Okay, going on to the third sustainability <laughs> indicator we're going to talk about today is seawater intrusion. And you've heard that enough about that. We have intrusion in two parts of our basin in Soquel Point, a little bit uh, more though in the seascape area where chlorides, the, the, the dots you see, the colored dots are, are <coughs> monitoring wells with concentrations of, of chloride that are high, the bigger the dot. Um, I've also um, added here uh, land use as the background and production wells because later on when we talk about what's significant and unreasonable, you might want to consider <coughs> different land uses. Are you okay um, having some seawater intrusion under some land uses and, and not under others? Or, and you want to be protective of your, of your um, production wells, so we're going to leave this up when you have that discussion so you can refer to it if you need to. Also, um, I just wanted to I put in a quick slide about overdraft. And at the last meeting, we talked about overdraft. And I'm not sure if everyone will understands. Yes. Well, go back one slide for a second. <coughs> for me, this, this slide is too much information. Yes. But I can't see the, I, I can't understand the interplay between the various information because there's so much in there. That's true. At, at this scale, if it was on a computer, you can go into it, and we can put these maps actually on a computer and through a web, uh, through geo technology. You can zoom into areas and have a look. With, so we not, can do that. Without a guide, I'd be useless. No, I think you can. Can you use your Google Maps? I think you can do it. Some days. Okay. Yes, I understand. I mean, this is, it is, it is just confusing. Just let me make one comment on that, though. While that's true, I don't have the time to do that. I mean, maybe everybody else in this room does, but I don't have the time to sit here and open up these things and go down. Somebody's got to condense this. I mean, for, for people to be able to digest this kind of information, I think it needs to be filtered. I mean, uh, just following up on their comments, like, how much do that? Okay, and I don't think that we expect any of you to be experts in, in, in all of this, but when we, when we come to the discussion part, the breakout groups, we're going to, you're going to be talking conceptually, you know, about land use, about, you don't really need to know where everything is, but you're going to say, well, Derek's going to give you some examples of considerations that you would make for each of these. I understand this is, there is a lot of information here. Okay. <coughs> so basin overdraft is where, um, in this basin, historically there have been declines in groundwater levels. The Soquel Creek Water District um, declared that the basin was in an overdraft and that there was probably much more pumping going on than in production. There are also, the groundwater levels were below sea level uh, or protective levels in, in many wells and that there's rising chloride concentrations. So overdraft is not one sustainability indicator or another, it's a combination of a number of these indicators. Okay, okay so, so that was a, a bit of a primer and I think one of the takeaways I'm hearing here is that especially when we're moving forward to deal with more quantitative information that we really need to think about how to present these data in ways that are accessible and useful to the advisory committee. I, 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 acknowledging that this was supposed to be an overview and reminder. Go ahead, David. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm, all, I'm curious about is that the, the graphs that you've been showing us show that seem, seem to be showing that the Basin was at one time in the past in a worse state of over overdraft than it is now. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the reasons why we're doing this exercise is because the state found at a particular point in time that we were at, at a level of overdraft that made us critically overdrafted, so we needed to be on the first tier of having a plan. If they were using the 2016 data instead of whatever data they used, would we still qualify? Well, I, think, I think that's a combination of things. Oh, I disagree. I think we do. Yeah. And I base that entirely on groundwater levels near the coasts. What is it? 50% of the, the monitoring wells are at, show groundwater levels near the coasts that are lower than what's necessary to keep the seawater out. So, yeah. So, but, but, but 
Well, so, I mean, so of, we do part nothing. of the question is how we, we do not reduce the basin. We do nothing and reduce the basin. Is that something? If your question is how does the state define critically overdrafted, they don't have a strict definition of it. They had a list of basins that they believed were critically overdrafted in the past. Those became critically overdrafted. They looked at other basins and said, for example, this basin, they said, this basin is at risk of seawater intrusion because groundwater levels are low. It is critically overdrafted. That's the extent to which they went to make this, this determination. Um, so I, I don't think I don't think there is to to get to the next level. I don't think there is a way we say we are getting out of this out of being critically overdrafted. We simply say it's an overdrafted basin, and we are going to get to sustainability there. That's probably our only approach going forward here. Could a, could a basin that's not overdrafted still have a seawater intrusion problem it has to address? Mm -hmm. Uh, could a basin that's not overdraft, you're getting into the legal definition of what overdraft is. Mm -hmm. Under the legal definition of overdraft, could a basin, repeat the question, counsel. The basin, <laughs> we do have a problem. We do have a problem. It's okay. we, we it's not that we, no, it's the point okay. is, we could still have a seawater intrusion problem even if we weren't classified as, as being overdrafted. Yes, you, yeah, you were critically, <laughs> critically overdrafted. Critically overdrafted. So Orange yeah. County might be a really good example of that. They've done some things to deal with their seawater intrusion problem, but what got them going on Water Factory 21 was the seawater, the threat of, sea, of seawater intrusion in their groundwater basin, right? Right. right. Um, I don't know if, and I don't know if there are basins that are threatened by seawater intrusion right now that are not listed as critically overdrafted, I'm not sure about that. Because because um, ultimately, how one defines these terms when you're measuring your goals and the extent to which you are meeting, meeting them will back into what kind of projects you need. <coughs> no. Defining overdrafted and critically overdrafted will not determine where you're going here. Well, I would argue, David, that if we're if we're on the right path to get us out of the problem, because you're arguing that our problem used to be worse, and we're in a better situation today, which I think you agree with. Yes. Um, so if you're, you're, you're what you're saying is if we keep down the path we're on, we'll keep getting better. It would be easier for us to not hit undesirable results, and therefore hit sustainability. Mm -hmm. right. And so I think that's because don't forget we we only have to plan for sustainability. And if, if what the path we're on is leading us that direction, then we're, we're doing the right thing. The question is, what what do we have to do? What 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 would, what would we feel isn't means that we're not continuing down the right path? Right. But right? So what would head us in the direction of making it to tell you which project or projects you need? Well, but first we have to decide when, when, when do we need to implement projects, right? Is it our ground level starts looking like 1980, or our change in storage looks like 1984. Does it look, it does it when stream levels change? I mean, for, the first step for us isn't projects. The first step is the discussion today, which is what is an undesirable result. So I think you're just kind of a little ahead of the, of the process. Well, well in, in a sense, I mean, there, there's a relationship between the two. I, mean, I, I absolutely 100% agree with you, but I just, I think that there's a, a first step, which is what does sustainability look like for us? And what, what what would tell us when? Because I think your argument is. Well, I'm not making worse. an argument. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. Well, it was. Okay, okay, but your first your first point was we were worse in '84. We're better today. Which means whatever actions we're taking, whether or not it's changing our behavior as a society, it's changing. We have more water efficient methods. Whatever it is, we're 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 drawing water less today than we were back then. Um, is, is leading or us we're to a healthier basin. the amount in storage by a lesser percentage yeah, than so, it was no, so, so, but, but we have a healthier basin as a result today. Um, and the question is how do we set standards so that we don't go mm -hmm. backwards? And the only way to know that we're not going backwards is to first set these sustainability measures to know we are, we are going backwards in the basin, we're not hitting sustainability, and then we need to implement projects, we need to change our behaviors. And well, so I think that, the first that's step. That's still a question. Is do we just need to institute management practices, or do we need projects? Yeah, but first we have to design sustainability. First, right. we have, first we have to answer the question of what does sustainability look like. I think that's my point. If I may, part of it is also, I mean, to your point is, 
we let's even take out of face value that we're doing all the right things and we'll if we did nothing hypothetically we'll be sustainable in 10 years that's a gut feel we think that and what i think sigma's asking us is quantify that yes. prove it to yes. right put real numbers i mean in any project management right you have a checkpoint prove to me that okay you say you're going to be there in 10 years then in two years of the year in three years of the year four years. once you do that then you can track it Right. The first thing is to tell us whether we have to have a project to do that or whether we can just do it with right. management practice. Right. The first thing is we need to know more measure and then know how to react. Mm -hmm. But then we'll so know if we need to add it or not. Okay, so I want, I want to pause here. I think this is important because we want everyone to be comfortable with these terms and where we are before we move forward. I'm hearing that, that, that regardless of trends uh, or overdraft, that we still have to go through these processes now of defining what these, these uh, um, let me get my mic, but the significant and unreasonable conditions are and what the undesirable results are. And, and I think where you're getting at is that in terms of the, the management actions you may take afterwards and, and, and quantification, things you may take different actions based upon the where we are. But so holding that and I think we're gonna get that to that in the months to come, Dave. I think we're not. Well, oh, hey, I mean, I'm just trying to get the thought context I need so that I can process this information. Okay, okay. Good. So I, I'm hoping this extra discussion help yeah, with that. And, and, and I'm going to try to reel us back to, because we're, we're a bit behind on our agenda now, there are three things that we want to do in the rest of our evening today in terms of discussions for the advisory committee. The first is we want to pause and ask a, a very threshold question of, um, are there, you know, in, in terms of advice from this advisory committee, you know, are, are there any objections to including these three sustainability indicators uh, in, in our plan? moving forward and we're going to do that first and then we have these two more detailed discussions around what are the significant and unreasonable conditions and what are the undesirable results. It's our first cut at having discussions around that because that gives definition to the technical team to, to be able to do their, their technical work. So, so if folks are okay, I would like to go to this slide and I don't know if I'm going back to Derek or to Georgina here. Uh, there's a threshold question that, that doesn't it may not take a, a lot of discussion, but that we do need uh, this advisory committee's input on. Okay, so you've heard a lot from us in the past few months. And now we're actually step one. Derek was talking about the steps to um, developing these criteria. And the first step is deciding on the applicable sustainability indicators. So tonight we're going to do that um, with the first three. We've broken it up. The next three will be next, next month. Um, DWR's default position is that GSAs consider um, all six of these um, as applying to their basin unless you have really good evidence um, that these conditions have never existed or will never exist in the, in the future. So that's basically the guideline they give. So in previous meetings we've discussed the fact that some sustainability indicators might be worth discussing before others because of their relationship between them. And so what I'm curious about is whether groundwater storage belongs at the same, in the same package with groundwater levels and seawater intrusion, or if that's something that you come to a little bit after you've worked on your groundwater levels and seawater intrusion. Groundwater storage is likely going to be more of a result of your management than in this basin. There are basins that it's very different at, where groundwater storage is gonna be very important. In this basin, probably it's going to be more of a result of your groundwater level and seawater intrusion. We're bringing it up now because it's this is the way we've packaged it into these three. But when we when I start talking about what is significant and unreasonable, I'm going to make a point that let's not dive too deep into groundwater storage right now because it will probably fall out of the other ones. Yeah, and you're absolutely right on that, okay? Yeah, I agree, Derek, but I feel like as long as we're measuring and addressing, I think this is what, what David's kind of getting to, as long as we're measuring and addressing um, groundwater levels and seawater intrusion, we will basically be addressing all this. Mm -hmm. We won't yes. be hitting, sort of, in our basin in particular, yes. obviously, we won't, we won't be, we won't be hitting storage problems mm -hmm. if, as long as we're addressing and measuring those two other issues. Like, well, We'll know. Oh, we'll hopefully we'll see it. We'll avoid it first, but then if, if there's a problem, we'll see it in the level of the seawater intrusion before we'd ever see kind of storage. Um, I think you're right, and all and we'll get to that in a minute. All because we will because we really want to do is 
what we really want to do is state this in a way in our plan that we don't get ourselves in trouble. We don't want to say we have we are going to have this huge amount of storage in a way that we can't get there. That's why yeah. I phrased it the way I did. Okay. <laughs> but, if we're, <laughs> but if we're measuring and addressing kind of these other yeah. issues of groundwater levels, even in or stream flow, or some yeah. of the ways that we're measuring and addressing these other issues, I think that we'll be encapturing this other issue of storage. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I agree that we have to address all six, but perhaps if we kind of phrase it in a way in our plan that the storage is one of the hardest ones for us to measure and the hardest that we can um, address that issue in that. So, so, so what we want to do here is literally to pause and very simply say, we, we've heard a presentation from saying that according to the definition of, from DWR, that, that, uh, that, that all, all six sustainability indicators are intended to apply to you or be applicable to your plan unless you make the case otherwise. And, and they've just provided a, a presentation on, on how all three do apply to a certain extent. But we do want to take an official weigh-in from the advisory committee here on this threshold question of, are there any objections from advisory committee members to including all three? And we, so we're not just assuming that, but we want to weigh in on this. So John. I think what you've heard, and I agree with what they've said, is I don't think we have any objection to including it in the eventual plan, but I think we're all saying let's concentrate on the other two right now to get grounded and to get educated and to spend some biting in time and let's not get distracted by having to do a third one at the same time. That's what I think we're saying to you. Okay. And Okay. Anyone else? What, what, wait, so yeah, I'm looking for responses like that. I'm yeah. hearing that yes, John, they apply, and we think these first two should be addressed. John, that's something that I'll have. No, no, Bruce, go ahead. Okay, so to me, um, I don't know what a what the minimum thresholds are for groundwater storage. To me, it's related to the groundwater levels and, and the seawater intrusion, and also to the stream flow. So it, it because it, it's not the situation where we have our bowl and it's full to a certain extent and we just have to be concerned that that we don't empty our bowl. The situation is that as we empty our bowl, other things happen. Right. And so, but that having saying that, you know, I think it's easier to go ahead and and do it than to make a point of not doing it. You know, since since they're asking for it, I would agree with that. that the, the, gr the groundwater storage and the change in the groundwater storage is the reason why you're vulnerable to seawater intrusion. It's the large rate of change in the beginning of these plots that have gotten us to the level where we've gotten to a point where we're, our changes in storage are fairly sustainable. So we're okay, but we're we're. Um, in we're in risk of drought or something like that coming and, and causing us the larger amount of groundwater s storage would make us a, a more robust basin so i think it is important to pay attention to setting the groundwater levels but also pay attention at the same time to the change in storage and the effect that has because that also is a health indicator but you, but you were saying that the seawater intrusion can actually impact on the, the change in groundwater level because that's still providing quantity in the basin. So it seems like we, it seems like in terms of priorities, one needs to deal with the groundwater levels and the seawater intrusion first, and then see how that impacts on your groundwater storage. That's right. So when we when we when we add the projects and management actions to the model, we use the model to get the groundwater storage in storage changes out and how much seawater intrusion there is. So we can, all, the, all of these terms all lead us to our, our water budget. And so we, we can then see the effects of those projects and management actions in, in the future. We use those for setting the objectives. So, so groundwater storage is more of a management indicator that you've succeeded in the other two areas as, as you're approaching your management tasks. Pretty much that's how it would play out. Possibly, yeah. Let, let me propose something. Why don't we go down this line? When we get to groundwater storage, it is possible that we might start that discussion and everybody would say, that's as far as we feel comfortable going right now until we know more about others. And if we get to that point, that would be great. 
Uh, but I'd suggest we start down this line, see how people feel and where they feel comfortable and uncomfortable. Don't go past a point where people feel uncomfortable talking about it. Does that sound fair? Well, it, sound, it sounds fair to me in the sense that it, it goes back to the discussion that we were having with Doug earlier, is that, is that we're not water experts and we're not going to be. So I, I, on one level, we're learning all this stuff so that we can make the decisions as a group about some of the policy questions that we have to make later on. And, but on the other hand, we're still not going to have the technical experts <coughs> to actually know what the appropriate decisions are. At best, we'll be making a decision within a range you're going to provide us as being scientifically sustainable. We aren't going to ask you for anything scientific like that. We're going to ask you for policy. We're going to ask you for your gut feel. What would you like the basin to look like? That's what we're going to ask you for. And so we're going to ask for your sort of interpretation of what you feel the basin, what you feel the condition of the basin should be in the future. I, and why. I really don't understand that concept. Okay. Sorry. Because, I mean, feel? It's like, gee, I'd like it to look pretty, right? It's like, you, you've got to be able to tie something like that to data and results. It's like, so take those examples. Groundwater level. If I were writing an outline, right, for this, of like, okay, we're writing a report and I want to go out to people and say, here's why you should care, okay? Mm -hmm. I can't just say, well, it'd be nice to have high groundwater level. Mm -hmm. It would feel good to me. I need to be able to say, we need high groundwater levels to accomplish the following things in this community in our environment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's scientific. You've got to be able to back that up and say it's going to cause the following results. It's not just a matter of does it feel good to me. What I want from you is part of the results you don't want to see. I don't need you to tell me scientifically how we get there. I want you to tell me what are the results you don't want to see. But then what you have to, that, right, but then you have to tell me what the bad results are that occur if the groundwater levels are too low. We're going to get and, there. Okay. We're going to get there. That's the this is a long process, yes, and we are going to get there. Which is, which is why the answer to your question is, if this is the way you think it ought to be packaged, sure, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> right, so I'm going to take Kate, and then I'm going to go back to the special. Well, just clarifying, and I think it's responsive to what you're saying, Doug. My understanding is what you're going to do in the context of this discussion is suggest these are the kinds of things that might be undesirable and significant. And I mean, you're not going to just say it's pretty or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to give us kind of a vocabulary of variables that would be logical to apply in each context. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think that helps. Okay. Um, yes. And, and so and we've actually tried to articulate some of these specific conditions you want to be paying attention to as, as you weigh in uh, from your, your policy question perspective. So, but before we move on, I, I just want to check one more time. Is, is there any advisory committee members who feel that we should not be including all three of these sustainability indicators in your ongoing discussions, acknowledging that I'm hearing we should be focusing initially on levels and sea and seawater intrusion before getting to school? Well, what I heard, I mean, I'm mad, I should shut up here, but anyway, what I heard people saying is let's focus on groundwater levels and seawater intrusion and come back to groundwater storage later and see whether we really care about it or not. We may come back and say we don't care. And we want to make an argument to DWR that we shouldn't have it as one of our indicators. But I don't think we know that yet. Right. right. Um, it, it, it's significant in the sense that we're proposing talking about it in our next two agenda items to talk about what some of these unreasonable conditions might be. Um, and so, yeah, and I think what you're hearing from us is that we don't think that's as significant as the other two. And then we shouldn't spend so much time on talking about that when we don't have a lot of data and we don't have a lot of information about that. And everybody's agreeing that it's related to the other two. So we should spend our time where we have... Focused on the other Yeah. Thing. Okay, and then well, for that third one to weigh in where it makes sense. So what, but I'm not saying it's not as significant. I'm just saying it's a function of the other two. And that we necessarily... It seems like we necessarily in, in, would discuss the other two before we discussed it, even if we ultimately want them to be a package. That's we, right. We I'm, I'm not saying let's not have it be in our plan. I'm saying let's not go and spend a bunch of breakout time talking about it right now. Right, it's not a pro it's a, it, in terms of prior prioritizing the topics, the other are, are, are first priority to get to that one. I would hate to feel that I got stuck on a breakout group talking about that when we don't have any data about it, and you guys haven't given us what's the size of the <laughs> of the overall thing yet, you know, and that we the other two 
are so important, relatively speaking. Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing certainly the two, and, and uh, we're taking a bye until we know more on the third. Fine, to capture the that's, notes, that's, that's not what we're saying. No. We're not saying I'm we're saying that we're, we're saying that the three of them may package together because two of them affect the third in terms of how one evaluates it or measures it. But, but and we want to prioritize the two that we need to determine the third before the third. Well, it's reasonable to me that we need to get into storage to know what's there. I'm a novice. Right. I don't know. We've got to spend a little time to see what's there there before we can say we don't think it's important. That seems to me. Then we can decide. Yes. We might, maybe it's not the most important, but we need to get into it a little bit to find out what's there. So, so actually, I, I think that what if we're going to find as we go into these three in whatever level of detail is that ultimately there's a lot of connectivity between some of the other ones that we're going to talk about next time. Streamflow in particular, I think, and possibly the water quality one. Um, less so on the subsidence, although maybe that's an issue that we will learn something more about as we get to the conversation we're going to have in the next time. But it seems to me that that what we're hearing we should pay attention to and go with that flow. We're going to get back to this one. It's going to be linked. We're going to see the relationships between them as we go forward. And I think we should sort of trust that we'll get there. Yeah. The, main, the main question here is uh, which are applicable. And so I think we're, everyone has said they're all applicable. Yeah. How we deal with them yeah. will right. be important. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, Sigma says we have to say something about them. Yeah. Yeah. Regardless, there's no choice here. <laughs> right. We would have to make findings in the sense as to why groundwater storage is not right. applicable. Right. And we we don't have any basis for doing that. So I'm, I'm seeing head nods around this that they're applicable and, and they're different. Yeah. At the same time. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so we want to move into the first of these. Uh, so, sorry, Eric, just one more slide oh, one here more on, slide. on metrics. And it's something that uh, we, we have started talking a little bit of, about. Um, so, groundwater levels, the metrics that we're going to use for minimum thresholds and measurable objectives, all of these criteria, are groundwater levels, obviously. For uh, reduction of storage, it's actually, it's a volume, we talked about that a little bit. It's one number for the entire basin. And we're going to get that through uh, through the groundwater model that simulates water levels. It's all linked to water levels, okay? And with um, seawater intrusion, um, the act requires us to actually put an ISO <coughs> contour or a line of equal chloride concentration on a map to say, you know, the, the chloride concentrations will not exceed this level. Um, but we are going to be probably also using a groundwater proxy where we have protective elevations that are set, the coastal wells, and we would set these levels so that we ensure that that uh, we don't exceed the isocontour limit on the map. And so um, that's that's how we how we are going forward. These that's how we think about these things in these in these metrics. Okay. Okay. So so let's jump into the topic of significant and unreasonable conditions. And, and um, so we do have a few slides to present on here and, and w which identify some of the considerations that, that you want to think about. The, the question that we really are trying to pose and, and, and we're suggesting that this be discussed in, in the in breakout group uh, context and then shared back again is for each of the focal sustainability indicators, what in your view would be a, a significant and unreasonable impact to the basic? Or, more closely, what, what could you not live with? So that's the question that we're going to come back to. And, and I should say here that in our packets that we did prepare a couple of handouts. Were these over there? I'm not sure. Yes. Yes, yes Darcy. So yeah, so we have for, for uh, this breakout session and this discussion considerations and identifying significant and unreasonable conditions. This is a document that has all the information and slides that you can then take with you to, to help guide your discussion. So let's go to the some overview presentation here and, and uh, some guidance on things to consider. Thanks, Eric. As Eric pointed out, what we're going to be asking for <coughs> is your feedback on what's significant and unreasonable. It's a qualitative statement. Remember the minimum thresholds quantify it. That's not where we are right now. 
We're waiting for, we're trying to get <coughs> of statements from everybody as to what they, what conditions in the basin they don't want to see. The one we're going to start with first is going to be the most difficult one, okay? It is the chronic declines in groundwater levels. This is one of the sustainability indicators. And what we're going to be asking for in the breakout section is what is it about groundwater levels that you find significant or unreasonable? So you might ask yourself, so what we've put up there are a few questions you might ask yourself, and there are dozens of others. And what we're hoping in your breakout sessions is you'll brainstorm these. So you might look at historical water levels, and you might say, boy, that was unreasonable five years ago because my well went dry, or something like that, or we just didn't like those water levels. You might decide some water levels are significant and unreasonable because of exactly that because they impact domestic wells in a certain way, because they impact municipal wells, because they impact agricultural wells. Those might be all three different ideas as to what is a significant or an unreasonable impact there. Uh, it might be that low water levels impact creeks, dry up creeks or something. Um, it might be the low water, water levels allow seawater to come in on shore. All of these are going to be significant and unreasonable impacts that you can control with groundwater levels here. And so what we're going to be asking for in the breakout sessions is among these questions or anything else that you can think of, what would a low ground what kind of impact would a low groundwater level have on the basin that we're trying to avoid right now? Okay? And that's where we're trying to go right now. So we want you to think about anything that might be an impact to you there. Yeah. Anything you can think of, your creeks, your wells, the seawater intrusion, anything like that. Health of plants, anything like that would count there. What we're eventually trying to do is to say once we understand what people believe is significant and unreasonable, we'll quantify that by saying to avoid these unreasonable impacts, we need water levels at certain at certain elevations everywhere in the basin. That's the next step. That's not the next the step today. Okay, but also note that when he says we, he's talking about the consultant team is going to do that and bring it back to you. So we need this input from you, this descriptive input, and then we go back and we have a look at the data. You're not going to be doing that, so don't worry about that. Yeah, it's okay. Done. Hasn't somebody made a list like this? Yeah. Surprisingly, no. And really? one, one is no, they have not. And two is, one reason they haven't is DWR is very, um, they're very strong to say they don't want to tell you what to think about. They want locals to drive what is important to local yeah, concerns. Well that's a, there. I mean, sorry. No, that's go ahead. A, that's a, I mean, I, I don't want to get into how crazy I think that issue, that approach is, but DWR isn't in the room that may have, you know, ultimately go to them. It's just, in, it's inconceivable to me if all the EIRs that have been written out there, that somebody hasn't made an exhaustive list of here is what you need to be concerned about when groundwater levels decline. I, it's just like, there have been, I mean, do you know how many zillion pages of EIRs have been written to yes. deal with issues like this? That got to be a lot of lists. And I would rather s start with a list and go, we care about this, we don't care about that, than to try to, I mean, maybe people in ag have things they think about, but it's like, I don't, all I want to know is that there's plenty of water. Okay. You're more of Sorry, I was going to say, so you're more interested in the storage question. No, I say, oh, no, <laughs> no, no, just in a lot of, plenty of water applies to a lot of things, but it's just like, I think for us, it just seems strange for people who are just common citizens who aren't in this business to try to write a list like this. And well, let considering me all, I mean, I'm confident that I could go find EIRs on projects that people have done that would talk about this for pages and pages and pages. Let me turn that around, though. Yeah. 
we are going to have to set a groundwater level in every monitoring well that is going to be our floor. Okay, we have to set that. Right. All we're asking right now is why is that the floor? Why would you say that's the floor? That's all we're asking is, is there a reason you think that is the floor? So, <clears throat> Derek, are you, is the process here that you don't want to lead us? I do not want to lead you and I am clear with all of my clients, my job is not to set local policy. Yeah. That is not my job. We're, that we're not asking you to set local policy. All, all I'm asking for is a list of what are the possible significant and unreasonable things that can happen from deploying some groundwater levels. There's not, this is a start of the list. We, you could try out wells. You could harm wells. Physically, you could harm wells. You could try out streams. You could allow seawater intrusion. I don't know if there's much, yeah. I would also say that we can start with the list today if, if, if you don't feel like it's complete, if like you're not comfortable with the list being complete, and we, we have an executive team. Like we, we can ask Ron, we can ask Ralph, we can ask Rosemary, we can say, hey, we're the water experts. Like, is our list complete? Do you think we missed something? I mean, like, we, we, we do have water experts in the room who we can turn to who are local water experts in particular because our basin, I mean, I think we talked a lot lately about, like, our water basin is not the same as the Central Valley water basin. They don't have to deal with the water. It's not something they have to deal with. We also don't deal with subsidence. We just can't talk today. Subsidence, like we don't have to deal with it, right? right. As, as, as much, we could, I mean, we really lose your our Um But, I mean, we have people who deal with our water basin all the time, and our water experts, and they're here to help us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the idea is that we were all tasked, we applied, asked for, we sit on this thing, right? Despite not being water experts, and it's our job to come up with the list. And if, we don't feel comfortable that our knowledge is strong enough that we, we can turn to our, our team that are here to help us and say, did, did we hit the mark? Did we miss something? Is there something you think we should add? In addition to them, we, we do have our hydrometric staff that can, maybe they don't want to give us answers, but they can like nudge us a little bit. In addition, maybe they feel like there's a little something we missed also. Like, we just have to, we have to start on our yeah. own. And I mean, I just, I'll, my, I, I'll shut up. It's, it's just, my only response to that is, I would find it much more efficient if somebody gave me a list to start with and go through. I, I, I totally understand, but I think that's why they're giving us suggestions. I mean, like, I think they're, they're kind of prompting us to begin something. I think we're going to have that problem a lot where we don't, uh, we don't, we don't I, I think we're going to have to find more information on this and more information. We have to start somewhere. Okay. Let, so let, just, me, just, let me just, 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 because if the question is, there are domestic wells, I don't want to know, yes, trying out domestic wells is significant and unreasonable. That's not enough. Is Do we have to worry about the shallowest domestic wells? Do we have to worry about the average domestic well? Do we have to worry about municipal wells because municipalities might have the money to deepen a well? Or something, does agriculture have the money to deepen a well? So it's not just the list, it is the question of, how significant is the shallowest well, the middle well? Those are the questions we need to answer today. Yes, David. But what, what Doug is getting at, which I frankly fully agree with, is how we use our technical staff. Mm -hmm. And and whether whether we want to get in a room and be creative about, you know, what what the the what the consequences of declines in groundwater levels are. I, you know, I, don't, I, I play guitar, but I don't write music. It's just not, it never, never hit me. But, and, and, and I'm going to play with the data that's not, that, that we are given to help establish priorities, but I'm not going to be creative in coming up with the alternatives because I'm not that grounded in this stuff. So to turn to our staff and say, you, you know, this is, uh, for people in your field, this has to be textbook stuff. You take a class, they say common, common results of chronic declines in groundwater levels, and they have a list of them. And we can look at that list and decide which of them seem to apply to us or appeal to us in ways that we think they're worth discussing more. Not having that list, it has us operating within the confines of our own experience and creativity, which doesn't get us very far, at least it doesn't get me very far. So in terms of what I want from my expert staff when we're dealing with a question like this, as does Doug, is tell me, tell me the top 10, tell me the top 20, tell me the top five. You, you know, you, you put down three, I'll come up with those three. I might come up with a fourth. But, you know, but that's not, 
that, that's not a productive use of my time, okay? I, I want that to be the use of your time so that we can make effective decisions. I would suggest you're starting to be Ralph Rosemary Ron's time then. If we're, if we're at the board asking for our, I mean, again, if that's, if that's what the whole board feels, and I think we need to ask our technical staff to be more active in, in, in the staff reports they get bring to us, which is a reasonable thing for us as a board advisory body, who is our actual title? Right. Right. To, to ask of our technical staff, and that's reasonable. Like if that's how we feel, then we it's reasonable for us to tell them like we we need more material brought to us in these discussions. Like we, we don't feel we're productive with the materials we're being given. If that's how we feel as a body, if, if that's what Doug's bringing to the table, then that's a reasonable request. That's why we. That's what I'm saying. That's why. We, that's my point. That's, that's right. why we have a technical body. So that's the 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 objective of Doug's comment, and that's the objective of my comment too, which is. That's why they're here. So if, if we need them to, and we need, need more to ask more from them, it's not hydrometrics role apparently. Then it's our technical advisory's role. At least that's my understanding of the way it's You guys can tell. You guys can tell us if I'm wrong. But I always thought that that was your role. Um, so I think we ask. Gee, are we? We ask you these things. Yeah. So, so, I, so guys, I have a not at all. No. No. So I have, I, have a, I have a proposal for for how to maybe do this somewhat differently from how we initially designed because I'm. I'm Plenty of resistance to, to mm -hmm. going down that other path, and, and I'm, I'm hearing. Uh, so my proposal would be to, to stay stay in our group right now, and, and and there are three of these, and we have the same question for each of these. You know, what would be significant and reasonable impacts to the basin? What can't we live with? And and um, and, to, and to, to propose there that it actually be a little more facilitated by you. And let's ask this question, and and you can list the things, <coughs> the considerations here, and you can even bring up some other ones and, and we can ask we really want active partic participation from the, the you know hard to do in a big group when there are 13 of us there are 13 members rather than in small groups where there are three of you or four of you but weigh in and say yeah I agree with that or no I don't agree with that and let's move on and we'll build a list and then we'll move on to the next question but Derek can certainly provide he can ask probably questions he can make you can say Derek what do you think and he'll say well this, this is what I think and, and then you can weigh in along along those lines. Would, would that work as a way of, of trying to get at some some responses from the group to the yeah. questions here? I'm sorry, can you go over your format again? You're hoping for each of us to, to bring our ideas to the table and just have Eric yeah. facilitate that? No, no, so, so rather than going to breakout groups and answering the questions in small groups, I'm proposing to stay in the big group here and then to, to literally have a, a, a bigger group discussion but at the same time, so there are, instead of just going back to the table and say, huh, here are some questions to think about, um, we can you know, walk through those and, and people can say, yeah, yeah, I care about that or not, and build the list and, and have it, it, but have him be a more, or Georgina be a more, uh, or other members of the technical team be, be a more involved part of that discussion. I just got the impression Doug will need more support than that for that. Okay. I, I don't object to us breaking up into the groups and coming up with whatever we come up with along, around these questions because that's the state of the data that's been provided to us tonight. And we're breaking up the small groups and we'll give everybody a chance to speak a little bit more as they're in the small groups. We can come back and report, that's fine. What I'm talking about, and, and, I, and I, I, I hope this is what Doug was getting at, is that in the future when you're bringing us tasks like this, give us the list. Give us some of the options. I mean, what in our history, you know, we don't want our wells to go dry. We also don't want to be on rationing. We don't want them to be at an insufficient level for us to be able to do things we want to do. I mean, we can infer a lot of things like this, but you know, but but you can, but all of those things are things that it turns out I'm, I'm convinced people in the water industry are like you actually have a list. <laughs> <laughs> you're wrong. Sorry, but you're wrong. The list, the list just doesn't exist. It just all doesn't common exist. results of having yeah. insufficient water levels. They, because it changes place to place, but this is this is the general list for this area. This is the general list. Now we can get into a lot of details onto that list for in exactly the way you said. And what we didn't put on this was a lot of details. A lot of details of is it okay for water levels in a municipal well to drop into the screen, or do you really have to keep them above the screen? Is it okay for and, and half of the screen? Uh, it, 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 <laughs> it, it, and that's exactly what we're going to be saying in these breakout sessions. Is it okay for half of your domestic wells to go dry? Two thirds, a third, a tenth of them. That's going to be a question you have to answer there. 
what is okay there, okay? This is basically the list of things you need to think about, but there are details we did not put on here. There are detailed questions that Bring we could have asked. Yeah. But I think if I may, I think to sort of make other point, at least for tonight, I think we should continue sort of with the format because we're here and we're already assembled. But next month, we've got three more to talk about, and mm -hmm. I assume a similar format, I'm guessing. And what I think we're, I'm hearing everybody say is for that one, outline some of the. I realize you're not your guide, but we do have staff who is, <laughs> right? And so outline those questions for us. And, and for example, I, mean, I would have never thought drop down to the screen or not. I know what the screen is, but I don't know, <laughs> right? So asking those questions are things for us to discuss, okay. right? Good so point. it's like, okay, okay well, if it drops down, these are the things you should consider. I, I happen to know someone who has a 40 foot well. Odds are, but can drive sooner or later. Pretty soon, regardless of what I do, they're just too shallow. Should we worry? I don't know. How many are 40 foot? I don't even know that, right? Is it the one, is it 100,000? Well, sorry. Um, <laughs> to not do that. But anyway, so I think what I think we're asking our staff is that at the next meeting we have a similar format, but please provide us the guidance for us to discuss. So we can say, well, this one we care, you know, one to ten, I don't know, whatever format we choose, even as an open group, but have something to work off of versus, hey, brainstorm, should it go into the screen or not? I don't know. But, you know, for me, the other piece about this is there there are pieces that are the imponderables. There are what if all of a sudden this county had to have 15,000 or more population in the northern part of the county? What if we have a six-year drought three times in the next 50? These are the things that, that impact that stuff more than just sort of saying them kind of overall. Yeah, we don't, you know, given where we are now, we don't want the sea to come anymore. Well, what if the sea rises, you know? what? I mean, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we haven't gotten into yet that would be pieces of this. And, um, there is, but it doesn't matter right now. Let me tell you that. It doesn't matter right now for a couple of reasons. One of them is we are trying to set a policy right now. Remember, these GSPs are policy documents. They are not science documents. They are a document that says, as a group, we are adopting this policy of what we want our groundwater basin to look like. That's what this is. You're going to adopt this policy. If something changes in the future, suddenly there's a huge influx of people, suddenly seawater rises, then you get to go back and say, that policy didn't work because of something we didn't see, foresee. <coughs> We're going to have to change it. Right now, you've got to deal with what you know what's on the ground right now, and set the policies for where you want this basin to go in the next 20 years based on what is reasonably foreseeable right now. Well, that's Don't what I'm go saying. down a... No, no, I think it's reasonably of, foreseeable that temperatures are going to rise in the next 20 years. That comes in. We have to deal with climate change in this GSP. We deal with it. It doesn't make a difference as to what your policy is of what you want this basin to look like. You, you're going to say, we want this basin to look like something, okay? We're going we're gonna to say, we can make it look like that with no climate change. But under climate change, you're going to have to change your policy. Mm -hmm. That's the iterative part. Then it goes back to you and you said, boy, we set the wrong policy because climate change is going to impact us. Remember this whole bit about this iterative issue here? That's what's going to happen. Right now, I am just asking for the basics of what policies are you all concerned about? What is What drives your policy in this basin? What drives your concern about the groundwater in this basin? Why are you here? You are, you're here because you're concerned about the groundwater conditions. What is it about the groundwater conditions you don't like about it? That's what we're asking tonight. Great, and so, so I think just to try this out, to try this out, I, I want to say, with regard to groundwater levels, let's try to answer the question. What, what in this group could we not live with in terms of, uh, in terms of our wells going dry, in terms of uh, groundwater levels being low that they may in, uh, impact creeks, in terms of flow of seawater, some of the things here. And, and you can look at this list and say, yeah, I agree with that. And, and let's let's write it down. This is this is a again. It was intended to be a little bit of a thought provoking list. It's not intended to be completely comprehensive, but certainly uh, to get the, the group thinking about these things. And if 
And if this captures it, let's note that. And if it's missing things, let's note that too. And, and I, I think it's really that level of detail. It's just that I, I think from the perspective of, of hydrometrics and the technical team, they don't want to just make assumptions about this and move on. And so they, this is a check-in with the group on there. Just to clarify, so do we just list the questions or some level of, like say, how much we care or how many, like, wells going dry. We can't make an absolute no well shall ever go dry, obviously. So are we looking to just isolate the questions or how important each of these are or somehow quantify it in terms of the minimum, the maximum. Obviously, not numbers. I'm not I wouldn't quantify it, but I would give us a gut feel on, boy, we don't want many wells to go dry, or, you know, we cannot manage our basin to the shallowest wells, but we don't want the average well to go dry, or something like that. Don't quantify it, but give us a give us a qualitative feel for what's important to the to the landowners in the basin. What's important to you? Does someone want to take a, a, yeah, a yeah, shot at it? I'll go out on a limb right sure. now. Please. I'm going to say I think an important thing is we avoid seawater intrusion. Can we start with that one? Sure. <laughs> and I, my question was, should we prioritize them? Do we have to get to like, yeah. for me, this is a very high priority. So I put this on the top. Please do. Please do we have to define yeah. how much we're going to say seawater intrusion? Are we going to say the 250? Are we yeah, going to say I, like I don't that? I don't think they want that level of detail yeah. at this point, right? So are we staying in our group or are we breaking up in our group? I, I, we're going to try this in the full group just to see what it's like. And, and if it makes sense, we can uh, break out later. But I, I think that just to demystify what we were trying to do, we can do it all together. And I think it's helpful to ask questions like this and what level of detail and Derek and Georgina, because this is really providing them with information that helps them. So, so thank you, John, for for going on with our and yeah. high, high, high priority makes sense for ours? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Mark. Not necessarily the next highest priority, but I will the average well should not go dry. Domestic, agricultural, municipal, does it make a difference to you? Uh, I'll say average, because I don't know what the differences are. I mean, okay. the, in terms of where they well, are, Well, right? domestic are going to be very shallow. Agreed. Domestic are going to be shallow wells. Oh, we've got 2,000 of them, and I'd, I'd hate for all of them to be dry. Right? Would you like the average domestic well to not, not go dry? Right. Yes. Would you like the average My domestic? gut would be yes. I'd okay. love to know what those ranges are before we really, really know it. That, I have no idea what We're going to come back with those numbers. Yeah. 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 Let's, say, let's say it's 400 numbers. to 80 and you want to say it's under, you know. Under 200, under, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? It's, but just for right now, I think just saying the average, you know. Yeah. Yes. That's Lack of exact data, I'll say average. I would okay. prioritize municipal wells as the highest priority. Water out? Keeps water. water out and the water levels high. Wait, can you see that again? <coughs> as, as we're protecting wells, uh -huh. we should look at municipal wells as far as making sure that they're, because those wells serve the greatest amount of population, that they should be protected as well as uh, protected from water levels and seawater. John, should they be protected if they're close to the coast? They should, they should be evaluated if they're in a municipality, that if the feasibility of moving them. As well, yes. So, it's, it's so, so it would be more of, of looking, evaluating the municipal well fields, and mm -hmm. as far as if there is a plan and moving away from the coast, how can we accommodate that, mm -hmm. but protect that, and, and that would mean finding another location for right. that. Right. Right. So that's what you mean by protect. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so, if, if, if there were municipal wells, are important to you because they protect. They, well, they, they serve. So, they, for a single a singular well serves more people in your. Okay. So it's a larger loss of water to people. Okay. Uh, to that point, I would not rank municipal wells as higher priority than domestic wells because for domestic well owners, that is their only source of water. So if those wells go dry, there's no alternative. So I think it is, although it serves fewer people, I think it maintains priority for a different reason. Okay. Um, <coughs> Allison? So for me, groundwater levels, it, it's important that, um, that as a source of stream flow, it's important. Did you say that again? Groundwater level as a source of stream flow is important. Can I ask you a little time? Ask leading questions on this one now? Sure, ask the group. Ooh, okay. I, will. I will. I <laughs> will. Um, <laughs> Would current conditions of supporting stream flow be adequate? 
because there are places now in the basin where groundwater supports stream flow and there are places where it doesn't. And so my question for you is, do you want to increase the number of places where it uh, supports stream flow with current conditions or would conditions maybe some other time in the past be adequate? Well, ideally, I mean, it would be better to increase stream flow because we've lost half of that. But, okay. I mean, but you're talking about, are we going with, we're going with significant and unreasonable, which is the, like, worst case yeah. scenario. Yeah, so yeah. That, I don't think that's what we're talking about right now. Okay. okay. Right? I don't, I don't think our lowest threshold should be to go back to where we used to be. You could. You could. Uh, you could. And in, in all honesty, if you want your lowest threshold to be much better than it is today, <laughs> that's your decision. Yeah. And that's fine to make that decision. Um, but if you think, no, the threshold of where we are today, that's okay, even though we'd like to be better. That's that's your choice too. Yeah. yeah I think at, at a minimum, for, from my from my perspective, looking at the cost of projects that would be necessary to return to sustainable levels in surface water flow is something that we ought to do. So we shouldn't give up on returning to a level of surface flow that would in fact support aquatic um, ecosystems, but. But we have to at least look at the costs of that and make a policy decision based on a weighing of those factors. Yeah, well, I, I absolutely agree with you. But right now, I think we're looking at significant and unreasonable, which is what we did not look at, versus we're not looking at undesirable, which is the right. Right. The question in front of you really is the health of your streams today. Let's, let's put it in one way. We can state it in many ways. The health of your streams today, would you consider that an unreasonable health? Should, would, would it, is it unreasonable the way they look today? But what is or the not? flooring is the way I read that? What is the lowest you would be willing to go? I mean, isn't that what this yeah. is really asking? Yeah, that, that's what I mean. So yeah. 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 I mean, is that, is that fair? Do better. I, 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 mean, I, I absolutely agree it should be better. I just don't know that, I mean, I guess the question of the group is today, the lowest we'd be willing to go. Well, I think we have a legislative form. Well, it's, it's not just a question to me of the lowest that we would do a go. It's striking an appropriate balance between the needs of humans and the needs of restoring the habitat to, to whatever arbitrary level we've decided we want, uh, whether it's 1930 or 1830 or whatever. So, yeah. when, we talk, when we talk about stream flow, there, this is where I think the, the group could uh, benefit from some expertise of there are areas in this basin where doing projects or putting supply wells would affect the streams more or less. And so I think if we understood that, that would help us to be able to cite projects in a way that beneficial in that way or would have the least effect on the stream to keep them at the levels they are today. But the reason I, I, I frame the, that actually the way I was sort of jokingly but not, but not really is that usually when you're dealing with habitat restoration you're picking some point in the past that you want to restore to okay, whether it be a point in time or a point of, of certain conditions and so you know that's that's really the question is we, we you don't want humans to have to compete with habitat for the water that you want that that you're able to identify a reasonable level of restoration that you can cope with, or that, and that you want to cope with, and part of that is the cost of your projects and your management functions to get you the water to get there. And as a, you know, as an additional element related to that, it's looking at the effectiveness of the ecosystem services that are provided by water courses at various levels, and whether in fact. Water filtration, for instance, might be cheaper if we had higher flow levels in our surface streams, not necessitating as much investment in hard infrastructure. So I think there's a, those kinds of issues need to be evaluated as well in terms of looking at stream levels. So, so I would just make a comment uh, from the ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem management, that I think that what you got to, David is sort of right. But I would, I would clarify what he says based on the idea that you really want to try to figure out what you're managing for. And so, for example, if you pick cold water fishery as your, your, what you're trying to manage for, if that's the right, then that drives a lot of other things because it drives temperature, 
whatever kinds of cold water species you have require have certain habitat and life stage requirements that drive what you need to accomplish. So really the way you get at this issue is to try to decide what it is you're trying to manage for. And then, then the issue is, are you gonna give it 100% of what it needs to, uh, you know, maximum? Or are you gonna give it 50%? Where's that balance point of, you know, hitting the mark? And if you have regulatory issues to deal with, that's a whole other sort of set of things. So I might have some just question. Sorry for my ignorance again. Could someone tell me, isn't stream water flow totally dependent on rainfall? No. Uh, how, how, well, what are the other factors that we can control water flow in, say, Soquel Creek? So, like, you know, when it, you know, like, rained last year, when there were really bad storms? Do you remember how for, like, weeks, even after the rain stopped, you kept seeing water flow out of, like, the mountains and stuff? Right. It's not, not all. It comes from the ground. It comes from groundwater. Like, there are, we have lots of creeks in our area that are not rainfall flood that the fact that there's water in them in summer doesn't yeah. they feed on the ground they feed on the stream underground oh. but uh, there are people in the creeks pulling water out too right. so they, that can affect it too okay so, mm -hmm. so trying to pause here so so we'll be going to this question uh, this is all information that's hopefully informing hydrometrics understanding of, of the advice they're getting here is do we have information that you need there are there questions you want to ask or is it Worthwhile to go on to another sustainability indicator. I want to ask a few more questions here. We haven't talked about agricultural wells. Any feeling about agricultural wells? Agriculture is very important in our area. Okay. And then, and by thank you for bringing that up because we can make this area by area easily. You can say, look, agricultural wells in a certain area in that's what we, we need to make sure water levels are above a certain level in Central Water District. But maybe it's not as important somewhere else. I'm not gonna tell anybody that their agriculture is not important, of course. But, um, but we can make this area by area. If you say well, it's important for the, all domestic wells to have uh, water, high water levels everywhere, you know, above, I don't know, above an elevation of 600 feet, let's say, something like that. We can play, we can do that also, okay? So in your, in your opinion, agricultural wells, very important in your area? I said agriculture is very important, but it's okay. not water, but it's <laughs> not going to speak up as agricultural representative. Exactly. <laughs> hey, you guys, let's face it, they're all important. Municipal, yes. domestic, and as she points out, the only source for some houses up in the hills and agriculture is feeding us. And you know, if we lose the water for agriculture, we're gonna run out of some levels of food. So they're all important. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tag on, on that. Um, earlier we talked about average domestic well, not going dry. Do you want your names published? When, when people <laughs> start going dry. Hey, you weren't average. You're, you're below average. I think we should have the, uh, the unreasonable effect be much more stringent. If we can, no wells should go dry, but maybe that's not feasible. I mean, well, possible because of geological. <coughs> so, Bruno, I mean, I do data science all day. You say it's safe like this, and the next question is, what's the data? Right, because there's right. a tail, right? There's a high number at one place, right. and the tail down, the tail. there's some of them at 10 feet. Are you yeah. going to tell me that, that, that you're going to guarantee that that 10 foot well isn't going to go dry? We can't, right? Mm -hmm. So once we know what the data is, then we come back and start focusing in. But this level, we can all talk about our concepts. So what you're talking about is if somebody put a, a well in really shallow, you they know. They may go dry regardless of what I do anyway. Exactly. Right. But an average to me seems not, it you seems, it's a lot of data. What else might you suggest? Uh, I don't know whether it's 1% or 5% or 10%, but to, to me, it, it should be really low. Sure. You don't, want, you don't want to manage in a way that people's wells start going dry. And I agree, but I'm saying we don't know what the bell curve looks like. So you're saying 5%, but you don't know what that curve looks like anyway. So no more than I do. Yeah, I, I don't know what the number is. Yeah, just in, con in concept, I don't want to see people's wells go. But, but I actually think that there's a strategy that is not a, uh, it's not a, it's hit the sweet spot. And if you do have impacts to people who have shallow wells, you can think about another strategy, a, a well deepening program, for example, that might be paid for by the 
by the MBA policy that helps people get a, their wa their well deeper, and that actually might be a cheaper thing to do and have a better out long term outcome than having a really really stringent you know nobody's well is going to go dry, and it's not you know it's not free to do that obviously, but it's feasible because I've done it. Well, you know that's that's part of the problem here is that we can say something and not know the cost involved so it, it it's going to be iterative yes exactly right. yeah. that, that's what well so first one i'm hearing is, is average has been thrown out there but you would like to know from us a little more what options are that are have many fewer than average the average yeah. will go dry yeah. you'd like to know what those options are okay. I, I don't even i don't even know how many wells are in danger of going dry I was going to ask that question. Yeah, we have to period of drought, do we know? Like, we had a pretty significant period of drought recently. Do we know? Well, John Baker might. Yeah, I know John's not here, so but maybe. When we talked about this before, John said he wasn't aware of any that absolutely went dry. And I gave him a, some anecdotal data I had of two wells up on Larson Road that I know did, did go dry, but they were up at a higher elevation. And they were, they were, you know, 120 foot deep well, so that's not very much when you're up in the hills. There's a guy up on uh, Empire Grade who came up to me at one of these meetings the other day and said, I, I live in an area where I just can't get water. I, I, I put a well down 200 feet and I just don't have any water. So he gets catchment. So that he just accepts that, that that's where he's at. But I mean, uh, and, but there were wells that did go dry in some strange locations. You know, and, and there are also people if your well collapses, all of a sudden, I had a well that collapsed and it was at 90 feet. And I got, I was down to, you know, half a gallon a minute or something. And, you know, that's just not usable. So, so, I'm like, so, 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 so I want to wrap this up and just because being aware that we're actually due for a break and we're, we're not through much of what we wanted to discuss. That, there's some other comments here. And Derek, I want to hear from you then. Because this is really important, you guys. Is, is this enough to move on to the next topic, or I don't think we're going to get much more. So I think yes, we. Well, so we'll, 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 we'll finish with you. Yeah. Yeah. But David and I know Allison, Allison for a while. You had a hand up before too. Bad. Then we're going to take a break. Well, okay. the, 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 Allison, 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 Allison didn't finish your question. Okay, no, go ahead. Jim. I was just going to say perhaps the um, our staff could take back to John that yeah. if he didn't ask. You know how many wells maybe were at risk of being going. I mean, because I don't think without a number of how many we know go dry or yeah. at risk of going dry. If we know the average depth of wells in our community, things like that, we won't be able Distribution, to distribution, whatever. Yeah. We won't be able to set these yeah. numbers. That's some of that information that the, the county obviously will have access to mm -hmm. from John. So if you could take that question with him, I think it'd be helpful when we discuss this next time. Yeah. Okay, thanks. See, to me, there, there's a question whether we should be even looking at how, how many wells are going to go dry or how we get water to people who may need it, um, whether they're on wells or on systems. For example, you, you could decide that there are certain parts of the basin that, that it's not going to be worthwhile to try and, and, and address their wells going dry because there's, they would have to go so deep that it might not be economically feasible. It might be cheaper to extend pipe to them and put them on a water system. So, so one idea to get around this quandary, one idea to get around this quandary is to think about all things being equal. So you go, we only want 2% if it's equal to, you know, drilling, drilling a, a deeper well or something like that. So it gives you a footing and then you can go back and do the cost analysis. So. Because otherwise, we're going to be sitting there going, well, what's it cost to do this? What's it cost to do that? Or whatever. Right, right, but you see, I'm not even thinking in terms of the number of wells that are going dry. I'm thinking in terms of how do we have sustainable water levels so that we can have a thriving, thriving economy, so we can accom accommodate the population growth that needs to happen in our area over the next 10 or 20, you know, 20 or 30 years, so that we can, you know, in addition to having a, a you know, what we would like to look at and see it be a nice environment that maybe we're not going to eat out of the rivers like the Obama used to do, but we want our kid to be able to throw in a line and grab a fish once in a while. Okay, so, so I, it's, we're two hours in and we're going to take a break. And, and so uh, please come back in 7 15, so that's 15 minute break. And then uh, and and sugar, 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 sugar,
topic of uh, significant undesirable conditions or unreasonable conditions we will move to the seawater intrusion topic and, and stay in the full group and talk about that and and uh, that we recognize there's certain benefits of having uh, Derek and Georgina being able to ask follow-up questions and you guys being able to ask questions of them we'll then move on to the last topic which is undesirable results and we'll again focus on the, the, the two main uh, sustainability indicators again levels and seawater intrusion recognizing that that we will come back to storage and that 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 doesn't necessarily have to be tonight but, but we will be following up building upon what our discussions are today uh, and that we're still planning on doing the public comment at a forum did you very briefly just, i was going to suggest that we've obviously lost some attention of us coming up with ideas or not but i would suggest that these lists I don't want to say living documents per se, but I mean, to, to catch a few more days, but it comes back in time. To, right, next time when we're talking about the next three, we'll be like, oh, we thought of something, but it's not really yeah. quality related. It's really we meant it to go there, right? And we'll be trading things back and forth and growing it as we gain our life yes. on the rest. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I don't think we can understate the importance of this being viewed as an iterative process. And, and this is a, certainly a let's get some initial qualitative feedback from the group, but this, this is not your last opportunity to talk about these topics. Okay, so we're going to talk about, uh, you, we're going to move to seawater intrusion. There, okay, we're going to avoid storage uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> so we're going to talk about seawater intrusion, and I'm going to cut this down to a very blunt question. There's a lot of questions up here, but we're going to, as Georgina pointed out in her talk, um, when we set a minimum threshold for seawater intrusion, it's a line on the map. That's what it is. It says, we want to stop seawater intrusion at a certain point. And the question we have for you is, where's that line? That's the question we're going to be asking. We could put it along the coast everywhere. We could put it on along the coast in some places and let it come inland a little in other places if you think that's safe. Um, and that's really what we're asking, is where does that seawater intrusion line go on the map that makes you feel like this is the right base, and this is the line in the sand that we don't want to pass. Yes? Where's the combat line, since it's not a wall but a wedge, uh -huh. and theoretically the wedge goes in, for all we know, 10,000 feet down, it goes in five miles, right? We don't right. know where it is. So it's a big line, right? I mean, I'm sure it's not that deep, but whatever. So how deep? How deep? <laughs> By regulation, we have to come up with that location in each of the aquifers. Okay. There, okay? So we're going to do it for each of the aquifers. It is going to be simplest for you if you say, this is where we want to, well, this is where we want seawater intrusion at every aquifer. Every aquifer is the same. We don't want seawater to come in past this in every aquifer. That'll be the simplest on you. You are going to run into complications if you start playing games as to different aquifers. So that's what I'm saying. That's no salt water at zero, no salt water at 200 feet down, no salt water at 600 feet down, no salt water at 1,000 feet down. Those are different things, right? And it's, it's a slope, so it's not a line. It's they are, but every aquifer will have its own little slope there, and we'll probably just be talking about the toe of okay. every one of them, okay? The inland toe. Okay. Derek, yes, can I ask Ron? a question? So, I think I cut up in this last time. So, is this the the maximum where we would want to live with, the maximum seawater intrusion. There may be another question that says, would we want more? Okay, I just want to- This is, this is the maximum seawater intrusion you want to live with. Mm -hmm. And it might be at the coast, it might be, gosh, there are no wells within a thousand feet of the coast here. We can live with it coming in 500 feet. You could say that. You are run into a little tricky game of letting it come in 500 feet and then stopping it, mm -hmm. but you could say that. Yeah. Yes. Does it need to be listed as a distance, or can you just say two production wells? 
You, uh, so, like, can you say like that you would not want seawater intrusion <coughs> to reach production levels? Like, would that be a, an allowable? Or just area of influence yeah. production level. Or, or do you have, or would you, or do you need to say, because you, you use the example of 500 feet. I mean, or could we say to production wells? You could say production wells. If you said that, Georgina and I would go back and we would draw a line among all the production wells that are the closest to the coast and we would say that's your line. Okay. I should, okay? I should yeah. clarify because those are I mean And that but that, that would be that would be a perfectly reasonable thing to say and we would yeah, that's the, what the line would look like. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I, yeah, so, so let, we'll do John and then we'll do John. Well, Charlie, well, Charlie, you, go ahead, John. Well, I was wondering, I, how do you know if we, if we stay at the coast without going out and drilling and sampling the water there? Um, I mean, she makes a good point about it being at production wells. That's, that's measurable. If we get a hit in one of them, we fail. But otherwise, we can say, oh, well, we know it's at the coast because, well, we're sitting it's at the coast. Well, we do have the monitoring, monitoring wells mm -hmm. along the coast. There are, uh, uh, there are monitoring water. wells all along the coast. Yeah. And so we sample those and we know what the water quality is there. And that's that's literally how you uh, draw that line. Yeah. yeah. There'll be other ways, but that's the basic. So, John and then John. So, just a question. My, my inclination is not to go beyond the the, the boundary of the, the coast, but I have a question. If we allowed it to go inland down at the eastern part, southeastern part of the basin, and that's the Aromas Aquifer, basically, if we allow some seawater intrusion there, is that going to contaminate the entire part of the Aromas Aquifer? Excellent point, and it will... Um, short sure answer is yes. You run that risk. I, I'm not going to say absolutely yes, but you, you truly do run that risk. Yeah, and it's, and there is this game also of if you allow it in the very southeastern corner, and Pajaro Valley comes back and says you're contaminating our aquifer. Yeah, they're only three miles. They're 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 then saying they're well. What they are saying is you have developed a plan that prevents us from achieving our sustainability. Oh, right. Okay. And I said, that's a little problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, John. Is the concentration of these production wells along the, the uh, seashore, would that be a reasonable line? Like we don't, um, what, what, what is seawater intrusion? Two parts per million? Um, 250, is that kind of a magical number? Would concentration be a, a line in the sand for any production wells? I was, I was trying to keep this conversation fairly simple, but you bring up a good point. What is the definition of seawater intrusion? We will probably set it at either 250 or 500, probably 250 milligrams per liter chloride, because it is a secondary drinking water standard. We could set it at other levels for agricultural reasons, if there were agricultural reasons to keep it lower or something. But you bring up a good point of we are going to have to come up with a standard number that is the definition of that line. Right now, my guess is it's going to be around 250 milligrams per liter of chloride there. But that's just a guess right now. But that's um, also the basement objective. Is it also the basement? It's the basement objective. So the state wants to see that, yes. <laughs> so um, so th that's probably how we will define seawater intrusion. So, so, so I, I want to know, if I'm going to tell you where I want the line, how sure you are that you can keep it at that line. Mm -hmm. So if you're not too sure, I want to be more conservative on where that line is. And if you're really sure, then I'm willing to, to move the line to farther away. <laughs> that is a great question, Bruce, and it's going to come up a little bit later. <coughs> okay. But there is this, remember I said the question about um, undesirable results is how many exceedances are you going to agree to, basically? That is, and that is how Firmly, are you putting your foot down, saying, "I am stopping seawater right now"? That's that's going to come up in that question. But to get back to where you are, how sure are we? If we will draw a line somewhere, how sure are we that that's where the line is when we measure it? It's only from the monitoring wells. That's what we know. The monitoring wells tell us that's where our that's where our uh, concentrations are. So if we yeah. draw a line between the monitoring wells and, and production wells. We don't know whether we've exceeded it or not. It's not measurable. 
you will likely end up putting in a lot more monitoring wells mm -hmm. over the next 20 years is what's going to happen. Okay, okay so question from Rosemary, and then I'd love to hear some recommendations of what can we live with, and what, what, how would you respond to the question? So, if we decided that we wanted to set the line offshore someplace, do we actually have a way that we could measure that and monitor You will not measure it, no. We will probably model it and say, yeah, we're doing pretty good according to the model, but you will not measure it if you set it offshore. So if you set it offshore, then you would do something with your monitoring wells along the coast that would probably try to link with the results at the monitoring wells versus where you think that the line is offshore? It's the water levels in the monitoring wells. Let's say the water levels in the monitoring wells are at a certain level, mm -hmm. and because of that it's pushing, the, we know it's pushing the seawater out. We could do that, it, um, but we would never actually measure the salinity mm -hmm. at, the, at the line. Yes. Could you run SkyTim every five years and get a feeling for whether your modeling results are correct? Yeah, you yeah. could, yeah. Marco? Well, that was my question. Is the is is the sky tank, sort of two-part question? Is the sky tank data like a measurable thing, or is it a model? Right. I don't know how to count legally. Um, and two, in, with regards to drawing the line, do we know where that line is today, either with sky tank or a monitoring model or a combination of the two? Because to Derek's point, my gut of a, of a place to start is don't let it come any farther. I don't know where it is, so I can't tell you where that is, except as a quality statement of, I wouldn't like it to come any farther in, but... It hasn't been observed in most of the basin. Right. It has been observed down on the southeastern side um, of, of the aromas, and in one or two wells out near Silk Hill Point there. Um, so it's been observed in a couple of places on the ends of the basins. Hasn't been observed anywhere else. Sky Kim gave us an idea. Sky Kim gave us an idea of where it is. And is it out or in? No, relatively, in most of the aquifers, relatively close to the shoreline. Most of them. I think one of them not. That will be presented March 20th at the uh, MGA meeting. It's not the 15th. 15th. Or 15th, whatever. Yeah. The next MGA meeting. So, does it, so these are actually great clarifying questions. Do we have uh, so I, I, wow, that recommendations be. for them? One more clarifying question. Is, is there a way to evaluate, I mean, I want to get to the point that you that you are making, John. But I mean, is there a way of evaluating the risk that any current intrusion will um, affect more of the basin? Contaminate more of the basin and render it useless. I mean, isn't I mean that's what I want to see. If if there's that risk, then we ought to push it back from where it is. You're not there. putting salt in a bathtub, though, right? I mean, they're not mixing. Right? It's there are two wedges that are pushing against each other. Which yes, there's a <coughs> between. But it's not because you have salt water on the coast, you suddenly have salt water on top of the mountain because as if you put you know. Well, salt in. I don't know. Is that right? Uh, let me, let me say something about saltwater intrusion here, about seawater <coughs> intrusion. It is very hard to stop it at a line there. Once it starts coming on shore, you can't, it's very difficult to stop it at a point. It either continues to come on shore and contaminate things, or you push it back. What you don't really do is say, it stops right here. Okay? So, it, so the point, I, I bring that up because your question of, would seawater intrusion continue to contaminate things? I say I would probably say yes, because it's very hard once it gets on shore to say stop right there. You actually have to push it back. So if we're going to push it back, we need to push it back. We need to we need to stop it at the shore. Like well, that was my statement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to get some some. I would love to hear multiple. My statement was stop it where it is. And Kate's statement was stop out of the shore. Sure, yeah. But it may not be at the shore today. Well, it's 17,000 parts per whatever that is down there in the southeast already. It's Where we looking for? Way high, more than what we'd like. We went to looking for that. Halfway. So we need to push it back out there if we can do that. Right? Well, if we can. Is it, that, that, that's a good point. John brings up a good point. Yeah. Is the goal to push it back out in that southeast so corner of the basin? Can that was going to be my question. And it's to the, the the people that are actually supplying water out of these aquifers. And, and the question is, what is significant and unreasonable? Where we're at today, is it, is it actively posing a threat 
to to the water supply now? Is that, or is it something that, that would need to be addressed uh, for protection of the future, or is it would it be something that is sustainable to a drought? There's very little production in the aromas. I mean, there's we heard just the yeah, yeah. So um, as of right now. Uh, that wedge that's there, I mean, there's monitoring wells along the coast there that we put in, that SoCal Creek had put in years ago and identified where that saltwater wedge is. It hasn't changed very much. It's moved a little bit one direction or the other direction, but it's still in that same location as before. And that's with SoCal Creek actually removing the production from that area. Yeah, we've, we've limited our production down where that is, but it puts it stre more stress back on the other basin. Mm -hmm. So, but there are some pumpers down there. The it's, it's a nice yeah. area. Well, yeah. so, right, so that was my question. Would that, would that be a secondary um, water quality, but to it, where you're saying 500 might be acceptable to the to the agricultural area? So I, I would look that in the discussion. Yeah, I was just, that, that's not a jumping concept. I was going to say, which is that I mean, the level we're setting right now is what we could not live with. Um, and we're living with what it is today, obviously. So the idea that we have to push it back is seems like a, a perhaps a high standard. Um, yeah, I know that Tuckle Creek did have to modify some of their practices in order to live with what they're doing today. Um, um, but, but, but you're living with it. And the question is whether or not we want to set the threshold of of making it easier on Tuckle Creek in particular. This is a general discussion. I have no opinion on this. It's just, Kind of saying where we are today with water. Um, and then the question of, that, that's why I asked the production well question, if we could use that, because obviously once it's in production wells, we, we can't live with it. Like, it's, uh, we literally can't live with it. <laughs> we will not wait alive. Um, and, and the question is, do we want to create some sort of buffer between the production wells or 500 feet from production? I mean, like, whatever we think, what, what do we consider living with? What is the minimum for us? Given, given that there, there are water districts that have had to make adjustments in order to survive where we are today. So really just, Jonathan kind of tapped on what I was, where I was going with my com comments. Yeah. Okay, and I have one uh, item, which is, if we were to set it at a place where wherever it is, there's gotta be some kind of contingency plan in that for drought, it seems to me, because there'll be less water coming into the basin mm -hmm. from natural recharge when droughts are happening which means that your ability to push seawater out will be diminished. So how do we recognize that there are some management things we can do when we have drought in terms of demand management, but we also have really low consumption patterns here already mm -hmm. that make that harder to be the only tool that is in the toolbox. And let me add on to that. I would say not only drought, but there are preferential pathways, and that's what you see going on. We see a lot of geophysical stuff and the sky trim stuff and in, in, in Monterey, it is that preferential pathway besides the pumping that's mm -hmm. it's taking. So, you know, what extra level of protection do you want for yeah. that in addition? Well, I don't think anybody would disagree that we don't want any production wells. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but. But I think we could do better and say it won't be any farther than today, which isn't in production wells. Yeah. We already have a, uh, a line of monitoring wells at, at along the coast seems like that would be a pretty easy place to put it to say we don't want to see any of these monitoring wells. So Other we wells than already. <coughs> yeah. And then the discussion I think will evolve into where Rosemary was going, what level of uh, insurance do you need to make sure it doesn't do that? And that, that'll be an interesting discussion because uh, if it's if it's right there and then you get a big drought and we can't get water levels in it makes its way forward so what buffers do you need that'll be a, a really insurance i think it's going to be yeah. yeah that's that's my concern okay. that's my concern with setting it with i mean i i obviously would love it not to go any farther than it is because i think we're in a, a, a scary situation but my concern is that if we got if we go into drought right now i mean given the low level of consumption i mean it, it could move next year and if that's our that's our significant and unreasonable. I worry about us hitting our undesirable results mm -hmm. and giving us a very small window to, to to work with. And I know that we have projects, we have other things that we can. I mean, that this is. I guess that's my my concern is if we make that our cannot live with level, 
that our undesirable results level will be triggered very easily, I guess is my concern. Um, it is, if, if we make the does not move at all, our end all be all, I guess is my, my, my concern. Because there's no, but I don't feel like I worry there's not enough of a buffer built in for things that can sometimes, I guess that's not my, my only concern. So, so, so Derek, do you have enough on this topic that you and Regina can? I think so. There seem to be two ideas, though, still sort of, or a few, either at the coastline, at the existing wells, or where it is today, seem to be. And there, those aren't that far off from each other, but it seems to be those are the three concepts that are out there. Is that right? And a component of uh, what it would take to make, to make that uh, drought resilient. Right. Yeah. We are, remember, there is a whole other um, step of objectives. These aren't objectives. And remember, we eventually build our plan to meet an objective, which is the, which would push the uh, seawater farther out. But I, I would argue that if, if, if the line is at the sand, literally at the sand, yeah. with the, just uncertainty in this science, that you have to have some buffer, yeah. buffer in order to uh, guarantee that it's just there. That would be my argument. Unless you're dead on with the science. Mm -hmm. So that was going to be my question. So if you were to, and I don't know what to do the project, but hypothetically, right? yeah. literally on the beach, we pepper it with monitoring wells. And we go down until we find something. Mm -hmm. And somewhere we will. Oh, you will. And we go way past it, right? And we know that way down here, it's at 2,000. Now we know where 2,000 is. And we say, OK, you know what? That won't go above. 3,000. Yeah, whatever, right? And pick another number, right? So because we're well into it, we're giving ourselves a chance, okay, you can push a little bit in, it can push a little bit out. But because today, as you said, there's three that are hitting it. The others, all we can say is they won't see it. But we don't know if it's one foot below us or 100 feet below us. We don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. We know we're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. but, but we don't know if I'm just right there, and then right. tomorrow with the next drought, it comes right in, or We'll never see it in 100 years. We don't, I mean, we have gas emits obviously with SkyCam, but we don't have a, a way to measure that to give us that buffer that we're talking about, right? So I think what we're saying is, it's, it's, like you said, we're all sort of dancing around the same kind of line, but what we're saying is we would like that line to be, there's a, the plus or minus, right? So, is that, so does that mean that the line moves or does that mean that the concentration moves? I don't know, that's a technical question for you guys in terms of how do you build into a line of, uh, an uncertainty. The, yeah. are, are we debating between the series of monitoring wells and production wells, trying to decide where we're going to draw the line in the sand? Is that what no, we're we, we've thrown three suggestions out. Basically, the shore, the where it is now, and production wells. Those are the three basic ones we've thrown out. There's three other variations, but I think they're all something that we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess I, I want to get a little idea of, of the relationship between these, like the distance, you know, and how quickly we might expect it to move between monitoring wells and so production wells, you, or, and reliability. Is testing some of these better than others? But is what you said, once you get inland, you can't stop it. You well, you can, but it's difficult. You, you can't really, it's very difficult to stop it at a point. It, it's either, Seawater intrusion is usually either coming in or going out. It's difficult to say it's stopped right here. Is it the only? I mean, we don't know that it's not static right now. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know that it's, yeah. My impression is that the, the, the seawater intrusion is an irreversible process within human lifetime. Uh, once it's been in, the, I, I object to the thought that you can push it back out. Uh, that it, it um, there are chemical changes once the chlorine atoms get in, ions get in there. And I don't think that you're, if we, suppose we suddenly had lots of rain and somehow we solved the infiltration problem. We had all the water we wanted. If we reduced our, our storage capacity, so the capacity, that not the actual amount we have stored, if the capacity is down, we have, we have, we are now, that's not sustainable. By definition, sustainability is, is a, you're going, you trend either up or even, but you don't go down. Uh, I, I think the irreversibility of seawater intr intrusion makes it a far higher priority than uh, exactly a, a, a buffer here or there who might be hurt. It's, it'd be a loss of storage capacity in the, in the whole water business 
the, as you well know, the most important and most expensive thing is storage. If you don't have storage, it doesn't matter where, how much rain you've got. Okay. So, so, sir, th thanks for the comment. I, I sort of want to bring it back to the advisory committee, given that we have the public comment period and we're creating that, that difference, but, but hopefully we can get back to that topic again when we get there. I, I, I'm looking at the clock. We want to move on to yeah. unsearable results. I think we have three here and, 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 and a lot of stress on the importance of a buffer. And, and I don't know if there's a single idea coming out of the group right now. So how many, if we were to use the production wells, how many wells are between the production wells and the, and the coasts? Between the production wells and the coast? Yeah. How many monitoring wells? Seascape and... Oh, how oh, many other wells and such? Oh. Um, I mean, so you mean Cabrini? 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 Yeah, private. 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 We can set, this is just the, the, the un, reporting, sorry. this is just the significant and unreasonable conditions. We could always set undesirable results, the, the fact that we find water, seawater in one of our monitoring wells. So we, right. we, and then that would trigger us needing to take greater action further. This is like the, the bottom line. worst of the worst that we're willing to even uh, like deal with, like exactly. even <coughs> accept. Mm -hmm. So, because I think your question is that there would be negative results before we got here, and we could set standards that would prevent us from, the objective is really to set standards that would prevent us from even getting here. So, so thanks for that. Because we want to get the undesirable results, I really want to wrap this because we're not going to get there otherwise. And, and so, again, Derek, is there a follow-up question to them that gets better definition around these three options, or? I don't think so right now. I think, uh, unlike on a lot of these, we're teeing up a lot of things that people are going to come back to us later on. Right. So I, I don't think we're going to get any farther in this discussion. So, so, so thank you for that. And apologies for pushing on here, but we want to yeah. make sure we hit some of these other topics. <coughs> we want to move to Undesired Roads Arts, and, and uh, Allison, that was actually a great sort of segue and a bit of an introduction to what we're talking about here. And here we're also going to talk about just two of the stable indicators. We're going to start with uh, levels. And then we'll start with, I'm going to start with seawater treatment because oh. it's easier. We start with, I'm going to ease people into this one and start with seawater intrusion. Remember, undesirable results are what gives us flexibility there. We either say we're going to be flexible or not. It's where we take all our minimum thresholds, all the things, we, all the things we're measuring, and saying it's okay if some of these get exceeded or we don't want any of these exceeded. We want to make this a hard line. And so I'm going to start with seawater intrusion because it's an easier question for you. If you say, we are going to draw the seawater intrusion line somewhere, I'm just going to say the coast for right now because it's an easy line, okay? We're going to say, we draw the seawater intrusion line at the coast. And the question in what we say in undesirable results is, do, do we say it has to be at the coast? We don't want any of our monitoring wells to show seawater intrusion. <coughs> or do we say, it's okay for a little seawater intrusion over here and a little seawater intrusion over here, as long as we're pretty much at the coast. That's why this is the easy question, okay, in case you didn't get that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll throw that question out to people to, for this for the seawater intrusion question. Is it something that we say we must meet all the minimum thresholds, which is really saying we mu if we draw that line, we must be at that line. Yes. yes. Everywhere. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is why I, this is why I, I know that you said this is the easier one, but I actually think the other one matters here because one, I think that all these need to be met, but it's because I actually think that the level here is that there shouldn't be any further intrusion. Mm -hmm. And because there shouldn't be any further intrusion, I think that we should have a minimum threshold that our monitor and also we shouldn't exceed. But we are actually uh, today. No, but I'm saying <laughs> that we set, we should set, and you talked about particles per, you know, and I think uh, so we have to say that one. The one that's there has to be able to exceed, or else we're going to have to push it out for it. Three, or three closed monitoring <laughs> weapon. So you have to get the over. So, but in order to meet the standard, we have to say that one has to <coughs> either not count or not. Or we fix it. <laughs> or we have to fix it. Yeah, we go back one step, just history, and say where are we on the monitoring well? Let's just try to get some basic. How far are they? Are. <laughs> no, no. <in> terms of <laughs> beyond the location, the concentration of chloride. 
in our monitoring wells. Those are monitoring wells, and those are here, here it is in a nutshell. The southern one third of the district has seawater intrusion at the level of halfway to seawater. Is that about the correct way to say it? Down the aromas. Halfway at the monitoring wells along the coast, the levels are around 15 parts per million. Is that right? In, in, the, in the aromas, which is halfway to seawater, where Georgina is, is doing it. That's a very simple uh, way to look at it. And then there's a point over there at Pleasure Point. That had a hit or two. Derek, are you allowed to set different thresholds at different wells? For seawater you... intrusion, it is one line in the sand. Wow. But, but okay. the line. It is a line, and that's the and that's it is slightly different so, than the water levels where you're setting a threshold at every well. For seawater intrusion, it is a line that you draw. With well, we can draw the line farther in. Yeah. Yeah. You can draw the line farther in. Yeah. If you want. Which is you essentially saying that one can be. And right. And the question. This part of the line with the, uh, this concentration and that part of the line with that concentration, or you can do that? No, it's. it's what? This part of the line with this concentration and that part with another concentration. Well, I mean, the, the, the further part in the south where it's already, you know, high. Yeah, you have to draw it in. But you would draw the line going. So do we know where the, 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 the two hundred right? Yeah. Yeah. You would draw the line going. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And the and the point that I'm bringing up here about this why it's the easier one it gets back to Kate's question earlier. If we allow a little seawater intrusion in the corner, can we keep it in the corner? Is the question, and the answer is probably not. So that's why, you know, it's uh, if you are wanting to say, yeah, we can make this. Uh, for our undesirable results, we can allow a little seawater intrusion here and there. We can have that discussion, but remember, it's going to be a hard one to keep in check. Mm -hmm. so, but, so that's the question that Derek is asking right now, is that can, can you have some, or would you be recommending as an undesirable result that having none, or having any would be undesirable? Right. right. I go back to my statement. We've got three that have it. So if we say none, we're automatically not meeting. Yeah. No, no, but you draw the line behind them. If that's no, if you, what I'm saying is the line you, oh, you draw the line. Right. Where you draw the line? Is that, is that a strong line in the sand? Are you saying I, that is our line? Then I go to Rosemary. It's, it's not 100% strong, strong, strong because we have drugs. We have to figure out where that two. We have to allow some fudge to that. Thing. We know that we that which probably moves. Right. Probably. Right. probably. Right. Right. Hey guys, if we get just one conversation, it's just it's tough to have multiple. Notes. So so you get to draw the line, and you get to have your fudge around where you draw the line. Once that line is drawn, the question is. What would be considered to be an undesirable result of that? That's what we're trying to get at. Yeah, but it mostly doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> we have to build that some drop move. probability. Yeah, right. yeah, so yeah. Rosemary. Let me ask this question: If we drew the line wherever, and we said, uh, "Okay, would it be an undesirable result?" I'm asking this question. If, if in order to maintain that line, we had to move all the, we had to move pumping inland sub substantially, would that be an undesirable result? It will be pumping inland. Mm -hmm. That's not under the definition of undesirable result. Undesirable result only is a question of are you exceeding your minimum threshold. That's the only question we have out there. Here, the minimum threshold is a line we have drawn on the map. The question is, do we want ourselves to exceed that line occasionally? Oh, so you're asking like two years in ten, we could exceed that line by <coughs> right. having it move. Right. Can we do two years in ten, or do we, have to, do we have to meet it every year? Do we have to meet it every well, year? Well, he's saying Always. you can just find the undesirable result however you want to. We can't. I thought it had to be no, no, every, no, year. Every, year. Thought every year. We can set it however we want to. We have to meet it every year, no? Yeah, there is a question out there about averaging right now, but I would oh. say you don't want to do it more than per year. So okay. you. Um, yeah, I would say I would say you're right. Every year you're going to have to after 20 years. Remember, we're out 20 years before you get an undesirable result. Next year, for the next 20 years, you will have no undesirable results no matter what happens. But 20 years out, the question is: Do you always want that seawater to be seaward of that line you've drawn, or are you going to say no? It can come in a little bit. So again, if there are 20 monitoring wells theoretically. We can't say 80% of them are reading within the desirable result, and that's our that's our undesirable result level. Yeah, 
That's, you can, you can. Okay. So we can but, give ourselves some fudge factor. But that, what that means is you've got some seawater intrusion coming in somewhere. Yeah. yeah. With yeah. the risk that it's going to contaminate yeah. the entire remainder right. of the basin. But that's that's the fundamental question. Right. That's, that's what we're asking. That's, right. that's the whole question. That's the question. question. Is that what you want to allow? Yeah. yeah, my question had to do with Rosemary's point. Since we have drought years, was could we say two out of five years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but it sounds like no. We he says it's, no. It's, a, it's, a bi, it's a bi year thing, like every yeah. year. But if you and look at it, if you are looking at it retrospectively, why wouldn't you say that we've had three years and 20 that we exceeded that or came in further? Why wouldn't that be okay if you're looking retrospectively? You could, but why wouldn't you just then draw your line a little farther in and say, we're going to draw a line a little farther in and we're going to hold that line? I mean, maybe that's what we would do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and if we did want to draw the line further here to avoid having to deal with all this 17,000 stuff down here, does that mean we have to create a bunch of new monitoring wells in where that line is? You probably is that will. the cost yeah. of doing that decision? Yeah, you, you probably <laughs> will. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Bobby Bobby. I, and I, I don't mean to be flippant sure. about that, but there, or there is a necessity to, def there is a necessity to, oh. To find that line. Yeah, yeah. Derek, could we use the existing monitoring wells that are in each different section to actually see that line move? As much as you can, you yeah. will. Yeah. And right. what the question that we're going to have to ask, depending on where you draw that line, is do we have monitoring wells in the right place right. to be able to locate? Well, absolutely. We are definitely going to need more monitoring yeah. wells, but I mean, using the existing ones. We want to use the existing ones all that we can. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so you want to I've got a question here. So the. You were talking about exceedance at monitoring wells, but this is a line that we're drawing. So, is it the whole line that yes. that we have to to, to keep that? It's, it's written a little line. oddly. It is the line. The it the the regulations are lit, written a little oddly, but the minimum threshold is not the individual monitoring wells. It's actually the line. So, what does it mean to exceed the line by? I'll pick 80% just for the purpose of discussion. I will not exceed the line by more than 80%. But the 20%, I exceeded it by three miles. Well, I it by <laughs> Is it linear? Is it volume? Right? I mean, well, that's a good mean? question. I, nobody's, I nobody's, nobody's, line. nobody's written one of these before. That's yeah. an excellent question. Yeah. Um, gonna be and which is why I am kind of suggesting we probably say we, we don't, don't want want to exceed that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would kind of be my suggestion on where to go. Yeah. Well, there, I think that's where we need your guidance as a professional because. If, if we go back to your comment that if seawater intrusion gets in, it's really hard to push out. So how do you exceed two out of 10 and push it back out? Yeah. So if that's not possible, this is where we need to, yeah. you know, give that to us, you know, or, you know, I know you don't want to guide us, but as a... It sounds like we want to fudge the line and then hold the line. Uh, my professional opinion would be wherever you draw that line, you hold that line. Yeah. You are going to get into trouble if you say we're going to allow a little bit of seawater intrusion because you really run the risk of not being able to stop it at that point. Yeah. So then our uncertainty, our drought uncertainty is we'll cheat the line That's farther right. in. We're going to draw the line further in. Just to buy ourselves that buffer. And I'm glad you're getting that because all of these concepts where you set the minimum threshold, what your undesirable result is, they're all going to be related. You've got to think of all of them together here plus your measurable objective remember your measurable objective is pushing that line even farther out but that comes much later it comes much later so we, we have Kate and then I just want to test this this idea he's saying of, of you get to move the line fudge the line but hold the line right. as, as it approach and, and are you guys okay with that guidance moving forward well, to your point if the alternative instead of drawing the line further inland than the coast, it's drawing it further out so that at a minimum you, I mean, it seems to me like that's what we really want to do because we don't want it coming past the edge of where we can do something to build a wall with, yeah. with the fresh water. Well, I, I was really asking the question about the tech, technically could you actually measure that and how would you, okay. that would be a hard thing, I think, to measure. If it were off, if offshore. It were offshore. Yeah. Um, and so we heard that the answer is you can't really measure it if it's offshore. But ideally, and the question is, what's the cost and feasibility of pushing it further offshore if you were trying to do that? Uh -huh. We don't know the answer to that yet. Yeah. But again, once every five years might not really give you enough warning about whether you're holding that line or not. So could you, could you use the monitoring wells and have a higher 
concentration of chlorine at the monitoring wells is, is your minimum threshold because there's a decay away inland from those. Does your line have to be 250? It does not have to be 250. Your line does not. It's a common line to use because it is the secondary uh, drinking water standard and it kind of is an indication of where you're having problems. I think Eric is asking if I have, sorry Bruce, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, uh, if, if I have a monitoring well that's measuring 400, and, but it's outside line, it's on the seaside of wherever we put the line. Uh -huh. And we know scientifically that you know, it slopes X. So if it's a 450 here, we can thus estimate that it's a 250x feet inland. Mm -hmm. So can we use that monitoring well to know that it's a 250 over here? You know, we're not measuring 250 over here, we're measuring 450 over here. You will always do that. Uh, you will always do that. You're always going to have monitoring wells that you're just interpolating between. Okay. Basically. Yeah. So, so that's I, I so I want to unless unless you draw that line right on the monitoring yeah. wells. Yeah. Which is right. a convenient thing to do. Yes. Just saying. Yeah. So we want to move to groundwater levels again, and so I, I'm hearing a lot of sort of clarification questions. But but I I think I've heard some support from this group about that where you put the line in and how you fudge for that is a key thing. But the idea of once you have that line of holding that line and saying no saltwater intrusion, that's. So you know what it's, Go ahead. So can you, it's semantics, but can you just please not use the expression fudge the line? Oh. <laughs> um, it's just, can we be, be generous with the line, be overestimate with the line? It's just, How about in, our, in, our, in, our, in our public document, can we not say, it suggests we're being inaccurate with it versus over, over overestimating. I don't want to, it's not like we're making up numbers. It really bothers me. Okay, so I'm, I just, it's a... Uh, no, I don't, I don't, you don't need to sit there to write the document. Thank you. So it's, uh, it's 8.30 and I want to take 15 minutes on this next topic and then I want to get to public comment. We know that there's, the public is aiming and ready to, to weigh in on some of these items. So can we go to the other? Right, other groundwater levels. levels. I want to talk about undesirable results for groundwater levels. Right now I'm just going to throw out some concepts for you and that you all are going to want to think about here, okay? Because it, this one gets more complicated than the saltwater intrusion one. Again, for groundwater levels, we can say a certain percentage of our minimum thresholds, we're going to allow them to be exceeded in any year. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of this is that as we manage things, as things happen locally, uh, someone, you know, I, I'm not sure, an uh, area gets paved over, recharge stops locally, things like that, we don't have to meet our minimum threshold exactly at every place and fall out of compliance suddenly be told by the state you're not sustainable because one of our wells was too low. So that's the advantage there. <clears throat> the disadvantage, of course, is that you run the risk of you know, someone's well going dry and us saying, huh, it's not our fault. We are not in an undesirable condition <coughs> of our definition. So there's this trade-off that goes on. So what we're going to have to do for this report is to say, it's going to be undesirable for a certain percentage of our monitoring wells in any one year to be below the minimum threshold. There are some tricks to doing this now, okay? And what you always ought to have in the back of your mind is what do you want the basin to look like and what is sustainable? One of the tricks, let me start with one of the problems. One of the problems is if we say 10% of our monitoring wells can be below minimum thresholds, and they're all concentrated. That whole 10% is concentrated in a certain area. We are really hurting a certain part of the basin at the benefit of the rest of the basin, and we get to say, we're sustainable. I'm sorry you're a little part of the basin, but you know we're still sustainable there. Okay, That's the problem, is the concentration in a certain area. There are tricks to getting around that. Okay, and the, tr the main trick is if you divide your basin into management areas, you can say our undesirable result is that no more than 10% of our wells exceed their minimum threshold in any management area. Mm -hmm. So that, in that way you kind of spatially spread out any problems there. You will still allow yourself to have exceedances but you make sure they're not concentrated in a certain area at that point, okay? 
these are things you're going to want to think about when you start thinking about what's an acceptable, undesirable result. You want to give yourself some flexibility so if one of your wells happens to be a little low that year, the state doesn't come in and say, you're not sustainable. But you don't want to set it up in, su in a situation where you are harming a certain area of the basin at the expense of the rest of the basin. And could you set those uh, minimum thresholds being exceeded in your different management areas differently? Basically? No, it has to be one statement. That's the, that's the trick. It has to be the same statement, except you can include the clause that we're applying this by man, but the statement by management area. You can't say no more ten percent management area, but ten five percent in management area. No, B, it's got to be it's okay. got to be number the number, the number. But you can apply that number in different management areas. What, would, what are the other purposes for having a management area other than? That's a great question because in the legislation there were certain purposes which turned out to be relatively useless. Oh. Uh, and so DWR's approach right now is whatever is going to help you get to sustainability. If you need to split up your basin into management areas, mm. that is what you are. And there, I can think of two really significant ones. One is this exact one. Mm -hmm that we set up, we split up our undesirable results into areas. The other is for simple, um, for kind of the, um, what do I want to say, the idea that you want to be managed by your own water agency or something. So often a lot of places are setting up management areas along their water agency boundaries because it's convenient for them to basically have their own water agency be the one that's collecting taxes from them or whatever they do there. Uh, it's for financial reasons. So those are the two reasons that are kind of thrown out out there. There's some other reasons. If you happen to have a basin with that's highly faulted and one side of the fault gets a lot of surface water, things like that, then you can break it up that way. But around here, I really only see those two. Can, 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 can you know the one sec? I just want to go back to the questions you're trying to get answered. Yes. So we can do this. One of them is the question about percentages. You're looking for a percentage? Yeah, we're looking for that. We, we're going to end up in our report, we're going to end up with that percentage. Oh, okay. Right now, right now, we're not asking for percentages. Okay, good. <laughs> right now, we are asking for how flexible do you feel you want to be? Do you want to feel like you want to be very flexible with your water levels? Medium flexible? Not very flexible at all. So that's kind of what we're asking for. I think it's up with John and then. So I, my, my thought about this along the way has been if we were going to do management areas that they would have to do with relative impacts on the basin. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, along the coast might be one thing and up in the Mountains where there more recharge happens from the rain might be another, and it might also have to do with the difference between Purissima and Aromas for some reason, for instance. So I can imagine we might have one, two, three, four, maybe four management areas. If you had that, it would make sense to be able to have some flexibility by management area because of the difference of the impact on the basin. Best example, seawater intrusion, you can't have a lot of flexibility there. But we, can't. but we have one number. We have one number, so we can't. No, but I know, but if groundwater levels near the, near the now we're on groundwater levels, we don't want to have a lot of flexibility in groundwater levels near the, near the coast, but we can't. Because of seawater so, so the way around that is to have a stricter minimum threshold near the coast than because farther, of, yeah. in, farther away. And you could do that by, I, by well and Yeah, like so, so my philosophy would be uh, minimum thresholds that are stricter and be flexible with exceeding. <coughs> okay. So so that you know that it gives you that flexibility. And then you've got more room than if you have a, a loose minimum threshold because then you're more likely to have a problem with exceedings and you have to be stricter with the with the percentage exceedings. Did everybody understand what Bruce just said there? Remember these, yeah, we, we stated. Well, remember these <laughs> concepts are interrelated. You're going to set a minimum threshold everywhere, and then you're going to say, how willing are we to exceed that minimum threshold? And Bruce is saying his preference is to have, is to have higher minimum thresholds, but be willing to exceed them, basically. That's one, and that's a perfectly valid approach there. 
The and minimum threshold is per well. Is per well. And then you can have different minimum, higher minimum thresholds in the places that are more um, impact. That's the part that confused me because I heard you just saying we had to set one minimum threshold. Ten percent. Bruce just said. We have to Bruce? set one undesirable result. No, okay, see, if it, if that's not what I'm asking you. You okay. said you just said minimum threshold, and and Bruce is saying setting multiple minimum thresholds. <coughs> so ten, ten foot in this months. well. 11 foot in this well, 12 foot in that, that well, you can do that. No, you're, no, I'm sorry. Maybe I, maybe you, I misspoke. Maybe you you set a minimum threshold at every well. Okay, you and they can one. all be different. Okay. You set one undesirable result. Okay, okay. Then I made a mistake on that. Yeah, you set okay. one undesirable result. And Bruce's statement was he would prefer to set relatively high minimum thresholds. But that one undesirable result allows you to allows you to violate a number of them at any one time, exceed a number of them. You might go to 20% of exceeds, for sure. instance. That's right. Yeah. So do others want to weigh in? So thank you, Bruce. Thanks, John. Um, and especially for those who haven't done yet. Yeah, John. John. No, I, I, like this, I like that concept as well. And then splitting them in different areas because you can weight effectively, because you have to have one exceedance uh, percentage, you can weight the importance of the different areas if you choose your monitor wells wisely. So we can and the threshold and the threshold. Yeah. Other support for that? And others? Well, we did. Uh, right. Support. Okay. I say. Uh, yeah, I, I support that as well. All right. I guess I have a question for staff. Maybe you guys can bring back to us, um, which is um, John had mentioned four, potentially four. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I guess that's something I would like you guys to bring back to us, which is what are the appropriate management areas and how many would be appropriate. Because I think that question is going to be brought up time and time again for each one, of, for all six of these. And so I think that we would, I would look for you guys to help us set what they would, should be. Um, because they're going to be necessary to know what those are so we can set the goals as we move forward. And so I, if, if you guys could help those that would be really helpful um, because we're we get one statement and we're going to apply them across the board. So okay, so thanks for that request and the staff will think about that. Uh, as, Kate, as part of bringing back that information, I would ask for evaluation of whether, in staff's opinion, management areas are in fact a desirable mm -hmm. way to approach this because there's clearly another way of structuring this statement about concentrations without referring to management areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be that wells. <laughs> within X distance or of each other shall not exceed that. And we wouldn't invoke the whole issue about having management areas with other implications about accountability and flexibility and so forth that we might not be in a position or that staff might not recommend actually establishing. So that gets to another point for me. The reason I think about management areas is partly for these measurement issues, but it's much more around when we get down to financial issues way down the pike. It's about, and I think it, it's, the management areas is less important than the concept of impact on the basin. And I think we all have to come to an understanding of what does that mean? What do we mean by impact on the basin? And I think that means we have to see the groundwater model in a lot more detail to understand that. And we need to have staff tell us what they think about that. But we need to come to some agreement as a group by the time we get around to assessing fees, management fees, and costs of things, we need to understand the difference throughout the basin of the impact it's having, and principally around, you know, how much water we have in the ground, but, but also salt water and, so, and streams, you know, that. So last comment, then we're going to go to the comment. It's a question, because I'm not sure if you want that comment. <laughs> the one of the things you've asked us a lot about today is like, how flexible are we on these things? But I feel like you haven't asked us like what our, our goal is in these undesirable results. And so I, I don't know if you want our comment on that. So I, I'm a little confused. Like you've asked us like how flexible do we want to be? You know, what do we want to use these management areas? But like, I, I don't know that you've asked us like, with, with the unreasonable things, you would actually kind of ask for our objectives. But with, the, with this one, with ground level waters, you've never really asked us what we want that to look like. So I, I don't feel like we've had a conversation of like what what that would look like. So I'm just curious. 
I'd like to ask you to just keep going because I'm not sure what the well, I'm I not sure what we haven't so, heard. So like, yes. I mean, so like what? Obviously, we want healthy ground water levels, but no one really said like what that would be other than healthy groundwater levels. So like, is that protecting stream flow? Is that protecting people having access to their well? Is that like I don't know that we had a conversation about what. And then, I mean, other than just it's going to be a percentage. We're going to talk about, we talk about what the structure is going to look like, and it's going to be strict, but what is strict, I, I guess, is kind of where I'm going with this. Like, is, is strict in mountains and loose at the coast? And I don't know that we talked about like what what an undesirable result will look like other than the fact that we're going to be strict and then let people exceed. But I guess I just don't Well, know. I'll tell you what I brought up, took away from it, and I might not be addressing this. For example, there was a discussion on uh, domestic wells at the beginning. And we said, we want, there were a couple ideas out there. We want the average domestic well to be protected, or we want at least maybe just a small percentage of the wells to, um, yeah, to go so dry. So you're just going to extrapolate from the unreasonable things into the and the results. those go into the minimum thresholds. The, uh, the significant and unreasonable go into the minimum thresholds. Then I heard a pretty good consensus that, you know, we ought to have fairly high minimum thresholds and then allow some, uh, allow some exceedances. So if I put those two together, I'm hearing we want a minimum threshold that pretty much protects most domestic wealth. That's what we want. But we're going to allow some flexibility in the undesirable results, saying even though we have all these high minimum thresholds that protect all the um, domestic wells, because we're allowing some flexibility, some of them might end up going dry here, because we're allowing 15, 20 percent of them, something like that, exceedances. Does that make some sense of what, yeah, how, how I'm trying to connect all these things together now? Yeah, no, I've, it's, like I said, it sounds like you're extrapolating from the original list. You're just going to craft it based on the things we created. The minimum thresholds have to be crafted on what is significant and unreasonable. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. And, and, but if you've got other ideas on what you consider significant and unreasonable, no, we, we would talk, love to hear them. No, yeah, we about it. I just don't want to only focus on wealth. No, and when we get to so next next month, when we will talk about the streams in particular, and there'll be much focused um, discussion on that. Right. Although the water levels, we have them as you know in the uh, and significant unreasonable. We didn't throw mention streams, but really that it's a cross over topic. It belongs also in the in the next sustainability indicator. And I think also to your point of what we want it to look like, that will, as we get more knowledge, will dictate what those percentages are. I think. Okay. So I so I want to pause and thank you for this discussion. And and it's uh, almost tend to, and I want to thank the members of the public for being very patient and, and having your opportunity to speak. So I'd like to see a show of hands of folks, members of the public who would like to share some comment. One hand, sir, you sure you want to share? Say, that's two, only two? Okay, great, so, so uh, I would invite you to come up here and maybe stand a little closer so we can hear from the mic and give your name and uh, any, any additional organizational information and then uh, three minutes. I'm Bruce Daniels, uh, I should be on the district board. I have a PhD in hydrology and climate change. And let me tell you a few things that might be of interest to you. Uh, about 50 years ago, they did a study in Powero Valley, and in that 50 years, the solar intrusion has gone in about a mile, so 5,000 feet. So 50 years, 5,000 feet, that's about 100 feet a year. That gives you some idea of how quickly that, that barrier can move. It'll probably be a little slower in Christmas because it's a tighter formation. But anyway, if you, if you look at 100 years, that's probably a good, good metric. Also about groundwater. You've been talking about these uh, wells along the coast, the monitoring wells. And if you're only looking there, you're not seeing what's happening inside the basin. So one way to achieve sustainability is move all your production wells to the back end of the basin and pump like crazy. And you won't see those at the coast for quite a long time. And you don't want that to happen because that would dry out the streams. And it does mean that eventually all that you know dewatering that happens there is going to make it to the coast, and then it'll be a disaster. But we probably will be dead by then. But that means the other generation has to deal with it. And I don't think that's a good thing. So you either have to put monitoring wells all over the basin, or you have to worry about you know the the supply of uh, uh, groundwater. And uh, so that's that. 
about this issue about flooding, that's clearly an undesirable impact, but it's not one that Sigma looks at. And there are probably lots of undesirable impacts that Sigma doesn't look like, look at. For example, let's say you come up with a project that costs, costs $10 billion. That's clearly an undesirable condition, <laughs> but it's not something Sigma looks at. It's just like an environmental impact report. It doesn't look at economics. It only looks at environmental impact. So there's some things that I think we're going to want to care about, but they won't go into the plan because the plan doesn't look at those. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sir, if I could let you come up. And, and so you your answer for you. Sure you don't have a comment? Since you are addressing that, I think it well, can would be more helpful. Give, 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 give well, this is a new comment on what you're talking about. I had many comments, but you never gave an opportunity for the public to, when things were fresh and on the table. And so my comments are dead now. They're old and stale. You know, it, when we've had other public hearings, you always have allowed opportunities on the issues for the public to speak. So my only comment is, I think you should go back to, you know, every couple minutes, when it's, whenever the board has said their piece, say, does the public have a comment? Okay, thank you. All right, sir, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jack Schultz. I'm a local civilian here. I'm um, doing a fair amount of water. Um, I realize you're seems, I'm sort of concerned we're just constrained by the uh, the legal aspects by the regulations from from uh, from on high. Um, it would be desirable if, in so far as you can, to actually do the work properly and then at the very end find a way to satisfy those kinds of regulations. By properly, and we use the word sustainability. Sustainability means that. It doesn't get worse, whatever it is. However we do it, that's what sustainability is. It's, uh, the concept of minimum threshold uh, disturbs me. Uh, I don't see how you can not have a, even though it may be part of the regulations, uh, I don't see how you can fail to have a matrix with potential population, potential rainfall, and if you were to ask this board to decide what is our goal, our goal would be somewhere in that matrix. If the population increases this much and the rainfall decreases or what, uh, you, you have a different number. And so th there's no such thing as just a, uh, some minimum threshold. It, it doesn't seem relevant to me. Uh, I guess I, I don't want any more time. The other thing that's concerned me is I'd like to hear the mo more about the absolute capacity of the, of the basin. Not whether it's nice to know how much is actually in it. But if we lose some of the capacity for whatever reason, then that's for all our children or for a long, long time, that's gone. And the, the capacity to store, I suppose we were to find a good way to increase infiltration and the rainfall were to get better. If we have no place to store it, that's the problem in Santa Cruz. We have lots, lots of water, no place to store it. And uh, storage, it, it seems to me, is a seen it going on and all this whole thing. Um, I appreciate all your work and I like to um, enjoy hearing you talk about it. It's at some point it's going to get a difficult question to suppose you were to make decisions about the um, seawater intrusion and then you are going to shut down a commercial well or a well that somebody depends on. Who's going to pay for it and how is the litigation going to be carried out? That it's unfortunately that's not a technical question, but it's a, it's a, a very relevant one. I'm afraid you're going to come into that before long. How do you actually write a rule, a rule that you have any hope of enforcing without in, incredible costs? Hmm. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, members of the public. So we're going to wrap by looking ahead to our next meeting. Um, so, I, so this again, we looked at earlier, it's the timeline, and just want to notice here that what we're in this six month period, which is the develop and evaluation of preliminary criteria for sustainability indicators. So we have several more meetings where we focus on that topic before we move more broadly into the groundwater modeling topic. And so our next meeting, uh, our next meeting uh, is meeting five, and uh, as we've mentioned before, um, we've been focusing on three of the sustainability indicators and thinking about 
um, significant unreasonable conditions and undesirable results. Um, and we're going to do that for the next three. So water quality, steam, steam flow, a stream flow, and brand subsidence. And we may try to wrap back in our discussion of uh, water storage and since we since we pushed that a little bit in sequence. Um, and then um, and after that, uh, we'll, we'll be then I guess build, building on that work and, and again in the spirit of having things uh, as, as a as a broader living process. I mean, we're going to try to build explicitly on the work that you've done moving forward. So big picture, that's where we're going. Um, final comments from management team or executive team members on, on where we are before we wrap up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Really encouraged by what I heard tonight. Just from the different comments and uh, concerns. It's great. Thanks. Okay, and I would add one more comment as the facilitator. You know, you're a relatively new group. Yeah, um, you're, you're, you're relying a lot upon a technical team and technical staff to help you along the way. And so the feedback you gave us today was certainly helpful in, in uh, guiding us to be more supportive for the work you guys are doing. Thanks. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, right.